TikTok, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's watching from all around the world. We have a debate for today. And the debate is on the topic, does the Old Testament teach that the angel of the Lord is Yahweh? And so we're going to have Anthony Rogers on the affirmative position and LJ Threepland on the negative. I'm going to give the format really quick and I'll probably review the format a little bit as we proceed. Um, but there will be 20 minute openings from each debater. I'm hearing some background noise. Who's got audio coming out of their computer? One of you has mm -hmm. audio. Not me. Somebody's got the video playing. Who's got the video playing? Not me. All right, we're going to have to deal with that technical problem here at the beginning. Hmm. I can, I can hear it. You can, yeah, I you, can hear it, too. You can hear two of them, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. I hear it, but I have. I don't even have the YouTube thing up yet. <laughs> All right. Well, we definitely can solve it. Oh, hey, we we can uh we can solve that real quick. Um. Uh, Anthony, hit mute your Skype real quick, and we'll check that. All right, you're muted. All right, the sound completely went away. So that's you, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> we can work we can work around it anthony we can uh we can always uh we can always have you muting muted whenever anyone else is talking go ahead and unmute yourself and we'll figure out what that is we might we might be hearing you through through the the headphones for all i know you might want to put in the other headphones okay but sorry about the sorry about the delay everyone but uh we don't know if we're going to hear any background noise until it's actually going live so um hopefully we fix oh. that right now you know what's happening? What? You got it playing on your phone? phone? Wow. I could hear my phone <laughs> because uh, I had the headphones on. Well, <clears throat> Anthony, I, I hope you're a better debater than you are at setting up Skype and because uh, this is horrible and embarrassing. Anyway, and, and what's bad is you make my channel look bad, right? It's like, it's like it's my fault when it's your fault. You know what I mean? All right. You're good, right? I hear nothing. Awesome. I'm good. <laughs> okay. I'm deducting 10 points from Anthony for this debate uh, for that horrible, horrible beginning. All right. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, where were we? We were on format. So 20-minute openings from each of our participants. Then we'll have a 15-minute rebuttal. Then we're going to have 10 minutes of cross-examination. Now, guys, that's 10 minutes of cross-examination each, right? It'll be 10 minutes of Anthony asking LJ questions and then 10 minutes of LJ asking Anthony questions, right? Yeah. All right. Now, some people are very strict on <clears throat> cross-examination in the sense that one person can only ask questions and the other person can only answer. I will let you guys set the tone. Whatever tone Anthony sets with his questioning, uh, LJ can, uh, can do likewise. And so uh, after that, we'll have five minutes, uh, five minute responses from each participant. So those will be the second rebuttals followed by five minute conclusions. And they've both agreed that they will take some questions from the chat at the end. So we'll probably take half an hour at the uh, end of the debate after the debate is after the debate proper is over, we'll probably take uh, half an hour or so to take questions from the chat. And I'll try to go back and forth. So um, when we get there, and I'll, I'll announce this again at the end, whoever your question is directed towards um, whoever your question is directed towards, you know, if you have a question for LJ or a question for Anthony, say who it's for because I'm going to try to alternate. All right. Well, uh, let, let's go ahead and take a, 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 you know, 30 seconds to a minute here at the beginning for each participant to introduce himself. Anthony, go ahead and tell them, tell everyone what, what your position is on this issue. Don't, don't expand upon it. Just state what position you're taking and tell everyone a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so I'm defending the thesis in this debate that the angel of the Lord, according to the Old Testament, is not a creature or a merely uh, created representative of God, but a divine person who properly bears the divine name, Yahweh. Uh, so my name is Anthony Rogers. I do apologetic work with you. I've been doing apologetics for many years. 
Uh, I wrote for Answering Islam uh, for a long time, as well as with you on your blog, Answering Muslims. And, of course, I produce videos with you on, on this channel. <clears throat> I also am an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church of America, and I serve in that capacity as the regional director for prison ministries in South Carolina. All right. Thank you, Anthony. Now, LJ, same question. Why don't you tell people, just give them a, uh, just state what your position on this topic is and introduce yourself to everyone. Hello. So I'm LJ. Uh, I'm taking the negative here and uh, I'm going to try to assert that uh, the angel of the Lord is not Yahweh. Um, so I'm from England, uh, but I live in the Czech Republic. Um, I've been a Unitarian uh, I've been a follower of, of Jesus and the one true God now for about eight years. Um, and I've been a Unitarian for all but about two months of those eight years. Um, I run a, a website called Following Truth, uh, where I have about 280 different writings. Um, I'm normally a bit of a keyboard warrior rather than a, a, a debater, uh, but trying to get into the debate scene so um yeah uh, i'm also an author i have uh, two books that i've written um available on amazon uh they are uh the uh the oh the name of the books <laughs> they are uh, is god moral um and the holy bible versus the hebrew israelites mm -hmm. in the second bible all right, and those would be under uh, LJ Threepland if people want to put those are, in. They are. Okay. They are, yeah. All right. Now, uh, a quick 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 uh, clarification for for uh, either of you. Anthony is a trinitarian and LJ is a unitarian, but the answer to this question would not strictly fall along trinitarian unitary lines. In other words, aren't there wouldn't there be trinitarians who don't believe that the angel of the Lord is Yahweh? Is that is that correct? Yes. Okay. Okay. So mm -hmm. everyone, uh, don't don't just don't just pick whichever side you're on. I'm going with the Unitarian, or I'm going with the Trinitarian on this issue because there can be uh, there can be some uh, difference of, of view. So so I encourage everyone to follow the arguments on this topic and see who has the strongest arguments here. All right. Is everyone ready to get started? Yes. I am ready. All right. And so. Uh, Go ahead and set this up now. LJ, if you could mute your microphone, and I'm going to get both of us off the screen, and I'm just going to let Anthony take a... Uh, Anthony, and this the same would go for LJ. I will start... Once we're all set up, I will start your... Um, I will start your time as soon as you start speaking. So as soon as you utter the first word, that's when I'll start my time. And uh, I'll give you hand signals. If you, Will you be able to see me, Anthony? Will I be on your screen at all? Okay. Yeah, I'll see you. Okay, so I'll give you probably a five minutes, uh, a two minute, a one minute, and uh, that'll be you've reached your time. And if I get mad, I'll kind of do this that you're, you know, now you're 10 seconds over, something like that. All right, everyone good? Yep. Okay, I'm going to get Anthony by himself up on the screen. And we have, unfortunately, just Anthony's face on there now. But, Anthony, you can start whenever you're ready. Okay. I want to begin by giving all praise and thanks to the Father, the angel of his presence, and the Holy Spirit, the only true triune God revealed in the Old Testament, and ultimately in the fullness of time in the person of Christ and the outpouring of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. The thesis I'm defending, as I already mentioned, is that the angel of the Lord is Yahweh, not merely a created representative. Now, before coming to my major evidences for this, I need to disabuse, I think, LJ and other Unitarians of several erroneous ideas reflected, at least in LJ's writings, that stand in the way, I think, of properly evaluating the evidence. First, according to LJ, to quote him from one of his articles, there really is no actual logical or biblical reason to understand the angel of the Lord as anything other than an angel. This statement, that, end quote, it, uh, falsely assumes that the Hebrew word melach, ordinarily translated as angel, is a generic title for heavenly creatures, such that uh, the phrase, the angel of the Lord, means that he's nothing more than what we ordinarily think of by the word angel. However, as Old Testament usage of the term shows, and as all Hebrew lexicons agree, 
The word melach simply means someone who's conveying a message. As such, the term is used for human messengers, the heavenly hosts, and even for God. For example, if you think of the Old Testament prophet Malachi, it's the Hebrew word melach. The word means my messenger. Obviously, Malachi is not a one of the heavenly hosts. He's a human prophet. Likewise, the prophet Malachi in uh, chapter 3, verse 1, refers to the Lord, Ha-Adon, as the messenger of the covenant, the Melach Haberit. There the word is used for God. Accordingly, the term doesn't have any ontological import. It simply refers to what someone is doing. Uh, second, when it comes to the full title, the angel of the Lord, Melach Yahweh, LJ has, I think, quite incorrectly stated that the phrase just refers to an angel and can be used for multiple angels. But this doesn't square with the following facts. Number one, because the word melach stands in construct relationship with Yahweh, a proper noun, it always has a definite meaning. The full phrase always means the angel of the Lord, never an angel of the Lord. Second, the full phrase is always singular and never plural, contrary to what we'd expect on LJ's view. While the Old Testament speaks of angels, plural, Malachim, it never speaks of the angels of Yahweh, Malachi Yahweh. That phrase is never used. Third, whenever this title is used, except in two cases reflecting later Hebrew usage, it always refers to one and the same heavenly individual. For example, in Genesis, we read that the angel of the Lord appeared to Abraham and to Isaac and then later to Jacob, uh, issuing divine promises and commands. This can't refer to different angels under the same title for many reasons. Uh, one reason would be, for example, because Jacob in Genesis 48 refers to the angel with whom he had to do as the same one who appeared to and before whom his fathers walked, uh, Abraham and Isaac. So it's the same angel under all of these uh, various appearances. Uh, it's the same angel who appears in Exodus 3 and Exodus 23 and Judges 2.1. In fact, listen to Exodus uh, 2 1, and you can see this. Uh, in, in Exodus 2 1, the angel of the Lord says, I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land that I swore to give to your forefathers. Here, the angel of the Lord says that, and this is in the time of the judges, says, I'm the one who led you out of Egypt into the promised land, just as I swore to your forefathers. So it's the same angel under uh, in all of these periods, the patriarchal period, the uh, exodus period, and the period of the judges. Since then, the phrase is always definite, always singular, and is uniformly applied to one heavenly figure across all of these accounts. Whoever the angel of the Lord is, he stands out as the messenger par excellence. In fact, although I have much more to say, what I've said so far strongly suggests already the divine identity of the angel. For it alerts us to the fact that he was the central figure in the lives of the patriarchs, the central figure affecting Israel's redemption, the central figure who bore Israel up on eagle's wings and carried her through the wilderness and safely nested her in the promised land where he continued to dwell with them and be their, uh, uh, their protector and provider. As David himself could say much later, uh, in Psalm 34, the angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him, and he rescues them. Since the angel occupies center stage in the history and religion of Abraham and his descendants, the one in whose promises the patriarchs placed their hope, the one who was the source of Israel's redemption, the one who was the locus of their holy fear, if Unitarians are correct and the angel of the Lord is not God, then God has been upstaged by a created angel. And this also points up, I think, the importance of our debate. This is not merely an academic or idle proposition that we're debating. It's those who fear him who are the special objects of his saving actions. The angel of the Lord encamps all around and saves those who fear him. Anyone who does not fear him should take heed. He's the one who overtoppled the armies of Egypt who conquered the nations that inhabited the promised land. He's the one that killed, slayed in a uh, you know, single stroke, 70,000 men from Dan to Beersheba in 2 Samuel 24. The same one who uh, struck down 185,000 men in the Assyrian army, according to Isaiah 37. Clearly, this is no ordinary angel. 
Well, with those uh, mistakes, I think, cleared out of the way, I turn now to some of the major evidences for the angel's identity as Yahweh. First, in Genesis 16, the angel of the Lord appeared and spoke to Hagar near a well, saying, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they are too many to count, thus making a divine promise that only God could make and fulfill. In response to the angel of the Lord speaking as God in the first person, Unitarians like to claim that this is simply because he's God's agent and so could speak as if he were God in the first person. However, at the conclusion of the account, Moses wrote in verse 13, then she called the name of Yahweh who spoke to her, you are a God who sees. For she said, I have seen him who looks after me. So Moses, the narrator, pointedly called him Yahweh, and Hagar just as emphatically called him God and said he is the one who saw her and that she saw with her own eyes. Moreover, in commemoration of his appearance to her, the well at which this happened was named Be'er Lachai Roi, which means the well of the living and seeing one. Interestingly, while post-Christian Talmudic Jews desperately tried to say this was uh, just the law of agency, uh, which later Unitarians picked up like crumbs off the table, earlier Jews, as seen in the Targum of Pseudo-Jonathan, for example, recognized the divine identity of the angel of the Lord and referred to him as the divine word, the divine memra in Aramaic or logos in Greek, who spoke to Hagar. Likewise, the Jerusalem Targum says, Hagar gave thanks and prayed in the name of the logos, the name of the word of the Lord, clearly showing that they understood this to be a divine person. Uh, moving on, in Genesis 22, we read that Abraham, or that Yahweh told Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, but when uh, Abraham was on the verge of sacrificing him, the angel of the Lord appeared, saying, and I quote, Do not stretch out your hand against the lad, and do nothing to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Here, while the angel speaks about God, he also shows his own divinity, for he countermanded the divine order to slay Isaac, and he said that Abraham had not withheld his only son from him, as though this supreme act of obedience and worship, offering up his very own son, was directed to the angel of the Lord. If the angel of the Lord were merely a created representative, then it would go beyond his prerogatives as a mere representative to be the object of such obedience and sacrificial worship something reserved exclusively for Yahweh, according to the Old Testament, as seen in places like Judges 6 or 2 Kings 17. Moreover, the angel of the Lord goes on in the account to swear by himself and then makes the following oath or promise to Abraham. Quote, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, indeed, I will greatly bless you and I will multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens because you have obeyed my voice. After the angel of the Lord appeared to Abraham and swore by himself, establishing an oath with him, we're told in Genesis 26 that Yahweh appeared to Isaac, and Yahweh said to Isaac, I will establish the oath I swore to your father Abraham. So here, the same one previously referred to as the angel of the Lord is referred to as Yahweh, and he's quoted as saying he is the one who swore the oath to Abraham because Abraham obeyed him. And once Anthony, again, as an aside, yes. Uh, Anthony, um, I, I gotta, I gotta pause you right there. You're having a, you're not having a Skype problem. You're having a mic problem. Now there are two possibilities here. Either there's nothing you can do about it, in which case uh, we hear everything you're saying. There's just this constant uh, uh, staticky sound that keeps uh, keeps blurting in there. Why don't you try switching headphones in, in case it's a, a problem of a connection with your headphones? Okay. Go ahead, go, go ahead and talk for a second. Oh, it might switch to these. Oh. How's that? What's that? Go ahead, go ahead and talk. I need to find out if you're, uh, your time's not running. Okay. But, uh, hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Okay, is it good? Uh, I don't know because it, it, uh, you, keep, you keep getting the staticky sound, so I won't know until you're actually going. Oh, I, I mean, I'm talking. So uh, how, does it, how does it sound? It sounds okay, but you get a cut. There's a there's a kind of crackling sign that keep, sound that keeps coming. I'm thinking you might there there. I don't know. There might be. It might be because you're wearing wireless headphones. So I'm gonna go ahead and start you back up. Why don't you go ahead and uh, you don't have any sound playing on your on your. No. Did you want to put the other headphones in? I can try it. 
Yeah, go ahead and put those in. Just uh, just let's see if those make any sort of difference. Are those wireless as well? Yeah, they're wireless. You ever heard of wired headphones? I have. You have a pair. How right. do these sound? Well, I don't hear any staticky sound, but I don't actually know. So, uh, uh, all right, we all good? We'll go ahead and uh, start up again. Start where you left off, and I'll I'll restart your time. And I'll give you I'll give you like an extra five seconds at the end, just because of the just because the cut, I cut you off. Go okay. Ahead. So here in uh, Genesis 26, the same one previously referred to as the angel of the Lord is referred to as Yahweh. He's quoted as saying, he's the one who swore the oath to Abraham because Abraham obeyed him. Now, once again, it's significant to note that the Targum of Pseudo-Jonathan on Genesis 22 refers to the one who tested Abraham as the word of the Lord. And in Genesis 26, the Targum says that God made the oath to Abraham because he obeyed the word. He obeyed the Memra. Well, uh, after these recorded appearances to Abraham and Isaac, Genesis 28 tells us that Jacob had a dream in Luz in which Yahweh appeared to him standing above a ladder or beside a ladder, it could go either way, that stretched from heaven to earth. And he said to Jacob, I am Yahweh, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give it to you and to your descendants. He goes on to say, behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. I won't leave you until I've done what I promised, end quote. Well, then we're told that Jacob woke up and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. In response, Jacob goes on to uh, name the place Bethel, which means the house of God. And to further commemorate the event, he set up a sacred pillar and uh, anointed it with oil, an act of religious worship, something elsewhere condemned when done uh, to other gods. Uh, the, three chapters later, in Genesis 31, we're told that the angel of God, or of the Lord, appeared to Jacob in a dream, and this is what he said to Jacob, quote, I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar, where you made a vow to me. So the angel of God says, I am the God of Bethel, thus identifying himself as God and as the one who previously appeared as Yahweh, the one to whom Jacob made a solemn vow and erected a pillar. Furthermore, in Genesis 35, it is written, God said to Jacob, arise, go up to Bethel and live there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. Here again, the angel is referred to as God who appeared to Jacob. And this time it's God who refers to the angel as God. To quote it again, God said, make an altar there to God who appeared to you. Moreover, further confirming that this is one divine person referring to another divine person, namely the angel of the Lord, as God, the text goes on to say that Jacob returned to Bethel, built an altar there, quote, because there, God, they revealed themselves to Jacob. Here, the Hebrew text literally says they in reference to God. They revealed themselves to Jacob. So according to Genesis 28, 31, and 35, the angel of the Lord is identified as Yahweh or God, by Jacob, by the angel himself, and by another person who's also identified as God. And across these accounts, the angel of the Lord is worship. Jacob made a solemn vow to him, erected a pillar to him, and an altar to him. If the angel of the Lord is merely a creaturely representative of God, one doesn't get the slightest hint of that from Jacob, from the angel, or from the Lord. And if the angel uh, were merely... A, a created representative, it would mean that God commanded, the angel approved, and Jacob rendered divine worship to a created angel as if he were Yahweh, thus making Jacob an idolater and making God complicit in Jacob's idolatry. Next, in uh, Genesis 32, 24 through 32, we're told that an unidentified man wrestled with Jacob until daybreak. As the story unfolds, it becomes apparent that this is a theophany, a temporary appearance of God in human form. For the man changes Jacob's name to Israel. He pronounces a blessing on Jacob and says that he has striven with God and prevailed, all of which leads Jacob to rename the place Peniel, which means the face of God. Because, as Jacob says in verse 30, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been preserved. We learn more about the identity of this figure in Hosea 12, verses 3 through 5, where the prophet tells us that the one who wrestled with Jacob at Peniel is the angel who spoke to him at Bethel, and then he categorically identifies him as Yahweh. Quote, in the womb, Jacob took his brother by the heel, and in his maturity, he contended with God. 
Yes, he wrestled with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought his favor. He found him at Bethel, and there he spoke with us. Even Yahweh, the God of hosts, Yahweh is his memorial name. This passage contains an explicit propositional statement identifying the angel of the Lord of all these encounters as Yahweh. Yahweh is his memorial name. Well, what we've seen so far in the case of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is that all of them, to a man, encountered, identified, and worshipped the angel of the Lord as Yahweh. All of this is summed up quite nicely in Genesis 48, when he proceeded to pronounce a blessing upon his descendants, saying, quote, the God before <clears throat> whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. Here, Jacob invokes the angel of the Lord, an act of worship, beseeching him to bless his descendants, and he does so by identifying him as the God of his fathers. This indisputably follows from the use of the singular verb, which ties together all of these descriptive phrases and assigns them to one person. The God before whom my fathers walked, the God who's been my shepherd, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, may he bless the lads. May he bless. Yeberach. It's singular in Hebrew. When we turn to Exodus 3, we see this prayer of Jacob for his descendants answered when the angel of the Lord, Exodus 3, 2, appeared to Moses in a blaze of fire from the midst of a bush, uh, which was nevertheless not consumed. Hard on the heels of this, we read in verse 6 that he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. However, to uh, escape the force of this, I noticed in one of LJ's papers uh, that uh, he said it was not God who appeared or spoke, but was simply an angel speaking for God in the first person. However, uh, the, the text does not say that the angel was speaking for God. That's something read into the text. But even worse, the text not only quotes the angel of the Lord speaking as God in the first person, but Moses expli explicitly says that the one who spoke was God. Verse 4, God called to him from the midst of the bush. Verse 7, the Lord said. Verse 14, God said to Moses. Verse 15, God furthermore said to Moses. In addition, the text also says that it was God who appeared, not simply who spoke. Verse 6, Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Verse 16, uh, God, God said, go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, has appeared to me. Finally, if Moses uh, was not really in the presence of God, who appeared and spoke to him, and this was merely a representative speaking for God, why was Moses not only afraid to look at God, but also required to remove his sandals from his feet, for he was on holy ground? Well, to give one final passage, uh, in Exodus 23, 23, Yahweh tells Moses, my angel will go before you. Of this angel, Yahweh says in the context, beware of his presence, literally his face, panim, and obey his voice, for he will not pardon your transgression. And the stated reason for why he's to be feared and obeyed and is sovereign in dispensing or withholding forgiveness is given in verse 21, because my name is in him. This statement completely rules out viewing the angel as a created representative who wields delegated authority rather than authority that is inherent to him because of who he is. Notice it doesn't say obey him because he speaks in my name, which is the customary idiom for delegated authority. But in contrast to all creatures, he is to be feared and obeyed and has the power to forgive or not forgive because my name is in him. Over and over again in the Old Testament, the name of God represents or is interchangeable with God himself. For example, Isaiah 30, 27 says, Behold, the name of Yahweh comes from afar, burning is his anger and dense is his smoke. Uh, likewise, the Old Testament speaks repeatedly of God's name dwelling in the temple, which is just a way of saying that God himself dwelt in the temple. To say then that God's name is in the angel is to say that he is the very embodiment of the divine presence and being. This is why the angel is referred to in Isaiah 63 as the angel of his presence or of his face, and is also why the exact same phrase, for he will not pardon your transgression, lo yisa lepishachem, is used for Yahweh and Yahweh alone in Gen uh, Joshua 24, 19. He is a jealous God. He will not pardon your transgression. This intertextual connection, the use of identical phraseology, is Scripture's way of interpreting itself. The angel of the Lord is Yahweh, the one who will not let the guilty go unpunished. 
Moreover, the fact that the phrase, my name is in him, means that he is Yahweh, receives even further confirmation in the ensuing context of Exodus 23 and 24. After Yahweh says in 23, 23, my angel will go before you and destroy the Canaanites, Yahweh goes on to say, you shall not worship their gods, nor serve or obey them, but you shall serve Yahweh your God, and he, speaking of him in the third person, will bless your bread and your water, and I will remove sickness from your midst. Here, Yahweh refers to Yahweh. Contextually, he's referring to the name bearing angel. The same thing seen in Exodus 24, but one, by the way, which is in the same context, when Yahweh says, come up the mountain to Yahweh, as though Yahweh were another person. Even the Talmudic Jews stumbled over this and said, Yahweh should have said, come up to me, rather than saying, come up to Yahweh. Contextually, he's referring to the divine name bearing angel, the one who bears his very name. All right. Thank you, Anthony. And we fixed, uh, that did fix the audio uh, problem. You're not getting the staticky sound. So that could be your regular headphones need some sort of charge or um, could be someone in the same area, like like uh, broadcast on the same frequency or does something on the same frequency. If someone has a microphone in the area on the same frequency, could be a problem. Uh, for those of you who are complaining when things get out of sync, that is not on Anthony's end. That's not here. That is an issue with Skype and everything else. So we don't need your complaints because there's nothing we can do about those kinds of things. So no need to whine that things get out of sync. That happens in live streams. You can still hear. Why are you whining? All right. Anthony, if you could mute your microphone as I pull up LJ. Uh, right, and LJ, if you have you unmuted your mic? Yeah. I okay. Have All right. You sound uh, you sound clear, and yep. so let me reset <clears throat> my timer here. Everything ready? I'm ready. Yes. Okay. I'm going to take us off the screen and have just you on the screen, and then let me see. Let me get just you up on the screen. All right. That is just you now, and you. I will start your timer at your. By the way, do you do you see me? If not, I'll give I you audio. See, uh, no, I can see you. Okay, so I will give you... Yeah. Now, you see me through Skype or you see me on the live stream? Uh, I'm seeing you through Skype. Okay, think, cool, cool, cool. So yeah, I, will, I, will give you, uh, I will give you hand signals. I'll give you a five, uh, a two, a one, and then uh, time is up. Okay. All right, everything good? All right, I will start your timer whenever you start yeah. speaking. Okay, so uh, before I start to get into my opening, uh, I would like to say that I certainly do not take this debate lightly. Anthony is a formidable opponent, especially for a newbie like myself. Uh, this really is a David and Goliath type battle. But if I'm not wrong, uh, David won that. Anyway, uh, while I wholeheartedly disagree with Anthony's conclusions regarding who the angel of the Lord is and the Trinity as a whole, Anyone that studies the word of God as much as Anthony has deserves respect, and he certainly has mine. I know the vast majority of people that will be watching this uh, will be uh, Trinitarian. So the vast majority of people will likely already think that I have lost uh, before I've even started. And I'm fine with that. I am probably not going to... Uh... Mm -hmm. I'm not going to convince anyone in this short debate that uh, their belief in a triune God is incorrect, or uh, even though it is. My purpose for doing this debate is to simply offer my understanding of who the angel of the Lord is, uh, and share my Unitarian beliefs with Trinitarians who may not have engaged with Unitarians before, and so may not fully understand our position. While I will outline my beliefs and defend those beliefs to the best of my ability, I do acknowledge my own uh, personal limitations. There may be questions that I am unable to answer here tonight. And I would say that uh, I do not proclaim to have all the answers. And I would say that anyone that claims that they do is a liar. Despite my years of Bible study, I am still learning. I am still a student of God's word, and I always will be. While we are here discussing our differences, I would like to draw attention for a moment, if I may, to something that we may share in common. 1 Corinthians 3, 4. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which was received, how, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Amen. As a Unitarian, I do not deny Jesus as the Messiah. 
who died for our sins and was raised again from the dead. I do, however, uh, as a Unitarian, deny Jesus as being God, and I most certainly do deny him being the angel of the Lord. Anthony is one of the few Trinitarians that I have come across that recognizes that if the Trinity is not revealed in the Old Testament, then if the New Testament does reveal a true uh, a triune God, then this would in fact be a different God than the one revealed to the Israelites, and so should in fact be rejected, Deuteronomy 13.1. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and that sign or that wonder come to pass, whereof he speak unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of the, that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Even prominent Trinitarian apologists, such as Dr. William Lane Craig, would not assert that the Old Testament teaches a triune God. He stated in a discussion with Rabbi Tovia Singer, and I quote, We are coming at this question from two different sets of scripture or holy inspired writings. And I would agree with Tovia that if you approach this question simply on the basis of the Hebrew Bible, or what we would call the Old Testament, one would not come to believe that God is a trinity. But if you approach this from the writings of the New Testament, which I believe are equally inspired by God, then the doctrine of the Trinity is taught there. So I think it depends on which scriptures you look at to see whether or not God is a Trinity, end quote. Now, he does go on to say, however, that he doesn't think that the doctrine of the Trinity is incompatible with anything revealed in the Old Testament. However, this, I feel, is actually one of the problems that Anthony faces with his belief. With this understanding that it, is a, that it is a necessity for the Old Testament to proclaim a triune God, or at least uh, in assertion, if not in direct statement, something that I myself would agree with Antony on, he is so desperate to make the Old Testament assert this triune God that he is literally reading the triune God into scripture uh, at every single possible opportunity. I rather think in some places he is rather grasping at straws in an effort to make the text fit the presupposed theological beliefs. I deal a lot with the Hebrew Israelites movement who assert that the true Israelites and Jesus were black. They literally grasp hold of any verse that mentions the word black and twist it in such a way that it can, at least without any, uh, without any uh, basic study, be used to support their claims. My book, The Holy Bible versus the Hebrew Israelite, goes through that argument, uh, showing them biblically incorrect. Shameless plug, sorry. Uh, did I? It's available on, on Amazon. Did I say that already? Nine ninety nine bargain. Uh, anyway, it is true that there were some Jews during the Second Temple period that did believe in two Yahwehs. This is not Trinitarianism, and it should not be used as evidence for the Trinity in any way, shape, or form. Beliefs do not necess necess necessarily equate to truth. Jews can be biblically shown to have worshipped Baal. This is not evidence that Baal worship is correct or that Baal is a true God. It's incorrect and should be dismissed as such. To obtain a belief that is based on the truth of the Bible, then we determine if that belief aligns with the Bible. When we look at the Shema, as found in Deuteronomy 6.4 and later stated as uh, by Jesus himself as being the most important commandment in the law in Mark 12.29, I think it is clear as can be. Shema Israel, Yahweh Elohino, Yahweh Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Yahweh our God is one Yahweh. Of course, the Jews do not use Yahweh but uh, Adonai. So we come to the angel of the Lord. I shall explain my understanding of who exactly the angel of the Lord is. Now, I want to make it clear that this is my understanding, and I do not in any way claim to speak for all Unitarians on this subject. I believe that the angel of the Lord is exactly that, an angel, a spiritual malach or messenger, as opposed to a human one, a spiritual messenger who is sent by Yahweh, who is distinct and separate from Yahweh, who represents Yahweh, carries the authority of Yahweh, but is not Yahweh. My understanding can be uh, demonstrated by scripture, Exodus 23, 20. Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. 
provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice, and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto thine enemies, and an adversary unto thine adversaries. So I shall break this down to how I understand this. I, Yahweh, send an angel, a malach, a messenger that is not human, a spiritual messenger, who is not me, Yahweh, before you, Israel. Beware of him and obey his voice, the angel's voice, when he speaks. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. But if thou obey his voice and do all that I speak. So the Israelites were told to obey the angel as Yahweh's name was in the angel. Yahweh's name being in the angel refers to authority. The authority of Yahweh was in the angel. Therefore, therefore to disobey the angel of the Lord was to disobey Yahweh. As the angel of the Lord had the authority of Yahweh, given to him by Yahweh, their transgressions would not be pardoned, seeing the angel's commands were in fact Yahweh's commands. This doesn't mean forgive their sins. Pardon their transgressions in the Hebrew actually means to carry all away or lift off the transgressions. So the angel would not take away their transgressions. They would have to carry them themselves. So rather than meaning forgive sins, it means that the sins would be imputed upon them. The understanding of disobeying a command of God given through, uh, through one of uh, Yahweh's uh, one that Yahweh sends can be shown elsewhere in Scripture. For example, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, Saul is told by God to go and destroy all the Amalekites. This command is given to, to Saul through the human prophet Samuel. Saul does not do as he is commanded and does not totally destroy the Amalekites. For this, God tells Saul that he has denounced him as king. Again, this is stated through Samuel. Saul states that he has sinned. He has transgressed the command of the Lord. Therefore, disobeying Samuel, who spoke the words of God, was indeed a disobeying God. And so Saul's sin of disobeying the words spoken by Samuel were imputed upon him as in reality he had disobeyed God. Now the prophet spoke the words of God just as the angel of the Lord did. This of course did not make the Nabi Yahweh a, a prophet of Yahweh, Yahweh in actuality. What seems to create the most confusion is that the fact that the angel spoke in the first person as Yahweh and things that he does are attributed to being done by Yahweh. If we understand that the angel of the Lord speaks the words of Yahweh and his actions are as if Yahweh are doing them because he has been given the authority to do so, then this really shouldn't be a problem. As the angel of the Lord speaks under the authority of Yahweh and being an angel, he does not require an introductory, thus saith the Lord. Of course, man has been made a little lower than the angels, Psalm 8, 5, and angels are ministering spirits, Hebrews 1, 4. So there are differences between the agency through the angels and that through man. The prophets, being humans, who also speak the words of Yahweh, usually use the thus saith the Lord introductory or equivalent to distinguish between their words and the words that they speak on behalf of Yahweh. However, this in themselves are not strict rules. There are occasions when a prophet speaks in the first person as Yahweh without an introductory, thus saith the Lord, such as Moses in Deuteronomy 11, 14, 15, Deuteronomy 29, 6, Jeremiah in Jeremiah 2, 7, and Isaiah in Isaiah 7, 10. It is also very likely that Isaiah is addressed as Yahweh by Ahaz in the very next verse. We even see that Moses states, if they the Israelites, would hearken unto the voice of Yahweh and observe and do all his commandments, Yahweh's, which I, Moses, command you. This is exactly the same way as the commands given by the angel by which they had to obey, Deuteronomy 28.1. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. Moses was the voice of the Lord to the Israelites. Moses spoke the words of Yahweh to Israel. Obeying Moses was obeying the Lord. The commandments that Moses gave were not his, but Yahweh's. Again, if we already understand that the messenger, the one who is speaking on behalf of Yahweh, can speak in the first person, it is simply not required for this to be continuously explained or introduced. 
We also see Moses being referred to as the voice of Yahweh when he is sent to Pharaoh. Pharaoh states, he is the, uh, Pharaoh states, who is the Lord, Yahweh, that I should obey his voice, Exodus 5.2. And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord, that I, should obey his, that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Pharaoh did not hear the voice of Yahweh. Moses, in actuality through Aram, uh, spoke to Pharaoh the words of, that Yahweh had told him to say. We are told in Exodus 4, 14 through 16 that it would be Aaron that spoke on behalf of Moses. Moses would be as God to Aaron and Aaron his prophet. This would mean that what, what Moses told Aaron to say, Aaron would say, and it would be as if Moses was saying it. The line of agent goes from God through Moses to Aaron. It must also be noted that in Zechariah, the angel does does use thus saith the Lord on numerous occasions. If we look at the book of Numbers, we will see that the authority of Yahweh was given to the Levitical priests. The priests of Israel were to bless in the name of the Lord. Yahweh's name was on them, Deuteronomy 10.8. At that time, the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord, to minister unto him, and to bless in his name unto this day. We can also see this in Deuteronomy 21.5 and 1 Chronicles 23.13. Now the priests blessed in the name of Yahweh and their blessing was as if Yahweh himself was blessing the people, blessing through the priests. This again does not make the priests Yahweh. We can also find scripture of Yahweh acting through his human agents. For instance, when God instigates plagues upon Yahweh, uh, upon Egypt, Yahweh states that he will smite the waters of Egypt with the rod that is in his hand. Exodus 7, 17. Thus saith the Lord, in this thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will smite with the rod that is in mine hand upon the waters which are in the river and they shall be turned to blood. In actuality, it was not Yahweh this was that, that was holding the rod. Neither did Yahweh smite the waters. We are told that it was Aaron who was holding the rod and Aaron who smote the waters. Exodus 7, 19. And the Lord spake unto Moses, say unto Aaron, take thy rod and stretch out thine hand upon the waters of Egypt, upon their streams, upon their rivers, and upon their ponds, and upon all their pools of water, that they may become blood, and that there may be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. And Moses and Aaron did so as the Lord commanded, and he lifted up the rod and smote the waters that were in the river, in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, and all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. Again, we have a line of command here, God to Aaron through Moses. We also have God parting the Red Sea through Moses. Moses was told to hold out his hand and with the rod and part the sea, which of course was done by God. We even see the agency of God through Satan. God enticed David to number Israel, 2 Samuel 24.1. We are told in 1 Chronicles that it was Satan who enticed David. God enticed David through the agency of Satan. If the angel of the, uh, the Lord is Yahweh, then Malak Yahweh in Malak uh, Yahweh, angel of the Lord, is redundant and meaningless. Yahweh cannot be seen or heard. God is invisible. Colossians 1.15, 1 Timothy 1.17. And so God revealed himself through agents. The one sent by Yahweh is the one that is seen and heard. And so this representative can be it as if they are Yahweh. I mean, if you are invisible, you want to show yourself to people, but they will die if you do. What else are you going to do? So that's all from me now. Uh, I shall address some of the points that Anthony brought up more directly in re my uh, rebuttal. All right. Well, LJ finished uh, finished a little early, so I didn't have to cut him off, unlike Anthony, who I routine, no. <laughs> routinely have to cut Anthony off. Um, all right, so Anthony, are you ready for your rebuttal? I am. <clears throat> I'm ready. Okay, I will 
All right, and Anthony, your voice is a little out of sync. Guys, that is nothing to complain about. We got people in completely different countries all broadcasting to me through Skype, which is then being broadcast uh, to YouTube. You're going to run into some technical difficulties. As long as you can hear him, stop your whining. <laughs> all right, I'm going to get just you up on the screen, Anthony. And let's see. Um, oh, LJ, could you mute your mic if you haven't already? And Anthony, you've got your mic on, so I'll start your clock whenever you start speaking. And Anthony has 15 minutes for this rebuttal, everyone. Okay, I want to begin by thanking LJ for his gracious demeanor, his cordial tone throughout this. I certainly have no animus uh, against uh, LJ, but as he said, these are important issues. He also, uh, you know, cutely mentioned, if cutely is a word, uh, that, uh, he, you know, he's like uh, David in this debate, and I'm like Goliath. However, I would uh, re uh, remind everyone that according to David in Psalm 34, the angel of the Lord was the object of his holy fear, the one that he trusted in to rescue and deliver him, the one who encamped all around him, clearly uh, identifying the angel as something other than a mere creature or representative. Uh, as the object of his holy fear, certainly he, he goes well beyond that. Uh, in any case, uh, LJ spent a good bit of time that I thought was irrelevant in a number of ways, and I don't want to get too bogged down into that. But he mentioned, for example, that uh, Tovia Singer, whom I'd love to debate someday, uh, newsflash Tovia Singer, uh, and William Lane Craig in a discussion with him, both said that they don't see the doctrine of the Trinity in the Old Testament. That's irrelevant. All that means is two other people could be sitting over there with LJ having this debate with me, and I'd be happy to do that. I'd put LJ, Tobias Singer, and William Lane Craig over there and happily do this debate and show why all of them are wrong. Uh, but uh, it, it was interesting to me that one of the observations he made about uh, the, the comment in that discussion was that uh, they said if somebody just reading the Old Testament alone wouldn't arrive at a doctrine of the Trinity. But then LJ turned around almost a minute or two after that and mentioned the belief among Second Temple Jews that there was more than one divine person in the Godhead, but then said, well, this is irrelevant because what counts is the text, not what certain Jews believe. I certainly agree. The text is the infallible word of God. It is the norm that norms all other norms. It is the uh, uh, you know, ultimate standard that we're to appeal to. But if you're going to say that we're, we can reject the notion of the Trinity in the Old Testament because certain contemporary Jews do, or even because some Christians do, uh, you know, and then turn around and, and uh, you know, uh, dismiss the fact that Old Testament Jews actually did believe in a plurality of persons, uh, I don't find that very consistent. Um, he also mentioned things like Deuteronomy 6, the Shema, Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad, and the fact that Jesus cites the Shema in Mark chapter 12. We are not debating monotheism today. I ardently affirm monotheism. And by the way, I would simply remind people to look at the context of Christ's use of, of the Shema in Mark chapter 12. Immediately upon the heels of affirming the Shema, Jesus then goes on to cite Psalm 110, where it says, the Lord said to my Lord, and in that psalm, you have two persons being referred to, one of whom is speaking to the other. And the one referred to as uh, Adoni, uh, Yahweh said to my Adoni, is referred to as Adonai in verse 5, an exclusively divine title. So Jesus very clearly shows that the Shema does not preclude divine plurality. In fact, we're told in the end of the account that he completely stumped the Jews and they no longer dare to question him anymore. Uh, well, a good bit of time was spent in LJ's uh, opening statement on the notion uh, that the angel of the Lord is merely a representative. He cited examples of this representative principle. He mentioned Moses, for example, going to Pharaoh and speaking on God's behalf. He mentioned Aaron uh, going and striking the Nile when Scripture says that God would strike the Nile. I don't think that he's adequately uh, analyzed those passages. However, what I want to observe here is that it's irrelevant because what he needs to do is not show that somebody could serve as a representative. He needs to give positive evidence that this, is, that this applies to the angel of the Lord. It would be one thing if this were a universal principle. Everyone is an agent. Everyone is a representative. But not everyone is a representative. That's an appointed position. And so what he needs to do is show that the angel of the Lord is a representative. He needs to give positive evidence for that. Now, imagine, for example, if I were to say 
that uh, when Genesis 22 says Abraham went up the mountain to offer Isaac as a sacrifice, that's not really referring to Abraham. That's just Abraham's servant uh, acting in his name. Now, LJ would be the first person to say, no, it was actually Abraham who went to offer up Isaac. But on what basis would he do so, given the arbitrary application of the principle of agency to cases where he hasn't given positive evidence for it? Uh, what's even worse, imagine uh, somebody could say to LJ, uh, you know, the father is not really God, according to the Old Testament. He's just an agent representing God. Now, how could LJ prove the contrary? He couldn't point to places where the father calls himself God or is referred to as God, because according to LJ, that, that sort of thing is consistent with the principle of agency, and no positive evidence is needed in order to apply this to anyone we please. In other words, if LJ is forced to be consistent with this overblown and overworked application of the law of agency, then it would be, uh, you know, it would never be possible to know when the Bible was actually talking about uh, someone or talking about his agent. And so LJ's own view, if applied consistently, would inexorably lead to the monstrous heresy of the Gnostics who said that God the Father isn't really the absolute God. He's just an agent representing uh, the ultimate deity, or maybe even a rogue agent. Now, not only did LJ fail to give any positive evidence for applying this to the angel of the Lord, but there's a whole host of reasons against making such an application. I'll just give five or ten. Uh, we'll see how we go here. Uh, first, uh, when we look at the biblical text, instead of the angel of the Lord ever speaking and acting like a representative of Yahweh and saying things in the name of Yahweh, or doing anything to indicate that he's merely a created messenger, in stark contrast to that, the angel of the Lord continually and consistently uh, calls himself Yahweh and speaks as Yahweh, and thereby gives every impression to those he encounters that he really is Yahweh. In Genesis 28, 13, for example, he pointedly said, I am the God of Bethel. Where does Moses, as a representative of God, uh, ever pointedly say that sort of thing to someone? In Exodus 3, the angel of the Lord emphatically declared, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Unless the angel of the Lord is God, then this looks less like the law of agency and more like identity theft. Uh, second, uh, it's the angel of the Lord alone, not angels in general, who speak and act this way. But if the principle of agency were true, then we would expect to find created angels routinely identifying themselves as Yahweh, like the angel of the Lord does. But this is something they never do. Never. Uh, we always and only find the opposite. For example, when Gabriel appears and speaks to Daniel in chapters 8 and 9 of his prophecy, he only refers to God and not also to himself as God or Yahweh. Three, not only does the angel of the Lord call himself Yahweh and give out every impression that he is Yahweh, something that's not true of any uh, angels, uh, any angel, created angel, but this is exactly how everyone from the authors of the various narratives to the people within the narratives always positively respond to him. Moses said, for example, in Genesis 16, she gave this name to Yahweh who spoke to her. He says it was Yahweh who spoke to her, and then she says, uh, you are a God who sees me. So both Moses as the narrator and Hagar identify him as God. Uh, Jacob in Genesis 28 said, as a response to, to God appearing to him, says, surely Yahweh is in this place, the same one that's identified as the angel of the Lord in Genesis 31 and Genesis 35. Hosea pointedly said about the angel, Yahweh is his memorial name. That's just not the way you would speak about a mere agent, right? In fact, God himself calls the angel of the Lord God in Genesis 35, 1, when he said uh, uh, to Jacob, go and build an altar there to God who appeared to you, referring to the angel who appeared to him. God says, my name is in him. Now here, I believe that LJ uh, really dropped the ball. I, I think I understand why he makes this mistake, but I do want to draw a good bit of attention to it. He says that, you know, people can speak in Yahweh's name. The priests had Yahweh's name on them. They spoke in his name. They blessed people in Yahweh's name. What it never says, though, of the priests or of anyone else is that Yahweh's very name is in them. The angel stands apart from everyone else as the one who in himself bears the very name of God. Just like God says, I will place my name in the temple. I will dwell there. The name represents God himself. God would dwell in the temple. God says, my name is in the angel. The angel is referred to as the angel of his very presence for this very reason. 
He, and he alone is the angel of God's presence. He alone bears the divine name, not angels in general or anyone else. God's name is in him, no one else. Well, uh, uh, fourth, it's uh, not only the, uh, uh, that the angel of the Lord, not angels in general, that uh, people identify, uh, I mean, it's, it's uh, not just that uh, he's uh, recognized as Yahweh, uh, well, other people identify him as Yahweh, right? Uh, the, not, I mean, n excuse me, none of the authors of scripture identify angels in this way, is the point I wanted to make. Uh, you know, nobody refers to other angels as God. It's the angel of the Lord alone. Uh, the angels don't refer to themselves as God. For example, when Gabriel appeared to Daniel in Daniel 8.16, he says he calls himself Gabriel. In uh, Daniel 9.21, he says uh, the, it refers to the man Gabriel. Uh, in 10.13, he uh, refers to Michael, one of the chief princes. They're just never called God or Lord or Yahweh or anything of the sort. Fifth, biblical figures who encounter the angel of the Lord uh, render to him the honor and worship due to Yahweh alone. They make vows of service to him, Genesis 28. They render absolute obedience to him, uh, Exodus 23. They erect pillars and altars to him, Genesis 35. They render sacrifices to him, Genesis 22, Genesis 35, Judges 13. Uh, they remove their sandals in his presence, Exodus 3, Joshua 5. Uh, they, they, they place their fear and trust in him, Psalm 34, and so on. If the angel of the Lord is not God, as LJ holds, then people like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Moses end up looking less like worshipers of the true God and more like idolaters for doing what God says is to be done toward him alone in places like Judges 6 and 2 Kings 17. Sixth, uh, such acts of devotion and worship are rendered to the angel of the Lord alone, no other an, uh, angel, no created messenger. We read of no created angel being worshiped as Yahweh or in the place of Yahweh, none of them being prayed to, none of them giving that, uh, the angels their, their fear as the object of their trust. Uh, when, when angels, uh, uh, when two angels, for example, uh, uh, appeared to Lot, he didn't remove his sandals in their presence. He didn't hide his face in fear. He didn't uh, erect an altar or offer sacrifices to them or anything of the sort. In fact, not only are angels not worshiped, but they, like all other creatures, are commanded to worship Yahweh. Bless Yahweh, you his angels, Psalm 103. Praise him, all his angels, Psalm 148. If the angel of the Lord is a created angel, why is he receiving worship as Yahweh rather than rendering and directing worship to Yahweh? Uh, seventh, in Genesis 48, Jacob prays to and invokes a blessing upon his descendants in the name of the angel of the Lord, whom he calls God, shepherd, and redeemer in the same context. It's uh, one thing to say someone uh, is an agent who can represent God, and it's another thing entirely to so completely identify an agent with God such that there remains no fundamental religious distinction between them, even to the point that this person can be prayed to as Yahweh. Eighth, while uh, prayers uh, are offered to the angel of the Lord, they're never offered to any other melah, right? Which we would expect if the angel of the Lord is just one agent among many, and if one can direct to an agent of God, things otherwise uh, exclusively reserved for God. Uh, ninth, uh, when the angel of the Lord appeared to people, it often became the occasion for people to commemorate the event by giving the place a theophoric name, a name that points to the fact that God himself appeared, such as Be'er Lahai Roi, Genesis 16, the well of the living and seeing one, uh, Bethel, the house of God, Genesis 28, Peniel, the face of God, Genesis 32. This is not true of the appearance of any created angels, but of the angel of the Lord alone. Moreover, if the angel of the Lord is not uh, is merely a shalia, a non-divine agent sent to represent God in his stead or absence, uh, in which capacity he can be called God and Lord, when he really isn't, why is he identified as God and Lord in heaven in Zechariah 3, for example, where the Lord God is present? Why is he functioning as a representative of God in the presence of God? It's one thing to say that God sends an angel so that he can appear in God's absence or in his stead, but there's no such need for that in heaven when God himself is present. But the angel of the Lord is still called God and Lord. And by the way, in Zechariah 3, the angel is explicitly identified as the one who forgives the high priest Joshua of his sins. Now, another thing that LJ said that I want to focus on briefly in the remaining time is that, uh, uh, you know, people can't see God, but people saw the angel of the Lord. What he seems to miss is that almost every occurrence where it says that no man can see God is in the context 
of people marveling that they've seen the angel of the Lord, and because they believe he's God, they believe they were going to die. But each and every account in one way or another notes that the reason they do not die is not because they were wrong. It's not because Hagar, Abraham, Jacob, and all these people were wrong that the angel is God, but because God had condescended. It was an act of condescending grace. Uh, for example, in uh, uh, Genesis 32, Jacob, it says, named the place Peniel, for he said, it is because I saw God face to face and my life has been spared, preserved. In Exodus 24, Moses went up the mountain with Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel, and it says they saw the God of Israel, yet he did not stretch out his hand against the nobles of the sons of Israel, and they saw God and ate and drank. The same thing is seen over and over again in uh, uh, appearances of the angel of the Lord. Uh, such statements show that the angel of the Lord is God, uh, but spared them when they saw him. All right. Thank you, Anthony. Let me get LJ back up on the screen here. Anthony, if you could mute your microphone, and LJ, if you could unmute your microphone. I will reset my timer. I will put LJ up on the screen by himself again. And LJ, whenever you're ready, you have 15 minutes for your rebuttal. Okay, so... Uh, this is why I don't like to go outside of the Bible. Um, Anthony uh, used in his opening um, Targums, uh, but he only used them when they supported his pre his belief. Um, the same Targums actually contradict. Uh, the beliefs in other places uh, where you don't use them. Um, I know that you believe uh, Genesis 1.26, where it says, let us make man in our image is the Trinity uh, and not God talking to his angels. But Targum Jonathan states, and the Lord said to the angels who ministered before him, who had been created in the second day of the creation of the world, let us make man in our image. Uh, the uh, Genesis 11:7, Jonathan and uh, Targum Jonathan, and the Lord said unto the angels which stand before him. So I know that in uh, you you claim that in Genesis 1:26, 3:22, uh, and 11:7, this is um, the, the the Trinity, whereas uh, the Targums actually uh, disagree with you here. Um, when it comes to, I know you didn't bring this one up, but in uh, when it comes to Abraham and his three angels, uh, the Targum Jonathan uh, has three angels and specifically identifies each job that uh, they had. The Bava Mitzvah 86b specifically identifies these three angels as Gabriel, Michael, and Raphael. <laughs> In the Second Kings 1934-35, the angel of the Lord that went out and smote the Assyrians at night is identified as Michael in uh, the to Tosefta Afarahat. Um, Jerome attributes this to Gabriel. Genesis 3.22 is actually explained in Samuel, uh, 1 Samuel 14.17. Then thine handmaid said, the word of the Lord, uh, of my Lord, the king, shall now be comfortable. For as an angel of God, so is my Lord, the king, to discern good and bad. And the same word there, uh, bad, is used in Genesis 3.22 for uh, evil. The Lord will uh, be with thee. Now, um, where do we go? Genesis uh, 48, 16. And he blessed jo Joseph and said, Before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life and unto this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, blessed the lads. Now, my understanding of this passage is quite simple. Jacob appears to God, uh, appeals to God, the God of his fathers, the God which fed him all his life, that the angel 
which redeemed him, blessed the lads, uh, Manasseh, Manasseh and Ephraim, the sons of Joseph, who was actually uh, blessing by asking for this blessing on the boys. An important piece of information here is Jacob doesn't know that the Malach is he is referring to is an angel. He simply uses Malach, uh, angel, is translated here in the English because we have knowledge that in the uh, that we have knowledge that Jacob was not privy to. Jacob is referring back to the man who fought with him. The man who had already blessed him back in Genesis 32 by changing his name from Jacob to Israel. Here, Israel is asking for the blessing, his name, to be put onto the two boys and that they be part of Israel. Jacob, or Israel, is blessing Joseph by blessing Joseph's sons, by asking God to allow the Malach to impart the same blessing upon them. Now, the Targum Jonathan uh, for Genesis 48, 15 and 16 uh, has this exact kind of understanding. And he blessed Joseph and said, the Lord before whom my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, did serve, the Lord who fed me since I have been unto this day, be pleased that the angel whom thou didst, didst ordain for me to redeem me from all evil may bless the children. Again, we could look at the blessings of the Levitical priesthood here uh, who would bless in the name of Yahweh. Uh, we come to Hagar. Uh, actually, I'll go to the angel of the, the Lord. Uh, now, it is in fact not a problem to run with the conclusion that Yahweh uh, being Def de definite would necessitate the rendering Malach in the definite. The angel of the Lord would not in itself be a problem, as the angel is the specific angel, the one in reference at any specific time, and it would be the angel, the specific one that is in re that is in representation. Malach Yahweh is used of the prophets. Uh, it's used of Haggai. And, but this does not exclude anyone else from being a prophet. It only denotes the specific prophet that is being re uh, that is being referred to at that specific time. The same would go for the priest in, of Malach two seven uh, of Malachi two seven Malach Yahweh. It does not exclude the existence of other priests. It only excludes other priests from being the subject of Malachi 2.7. There is no indefinite article in Hebrew. So to write an angel of the Lord would be exactly the same as the angel of the Lord. It's the context that denotes uh, who, what the uh, indefinite or the, the definite article would be. There are times when it would be incorrect to translate a noun as definite, even when followed by the definite Yahweh, as recognized by many translators, such as in Exodus 10.9. And Moses said, we will go with our young and with our old, with our sons and with our daughters, with our flocks and with our herds. Will we go for we must hold a feast unto the Lord. The Hebrew here is Hag Yahweh, Feast Yahweh, translated as a feast in the NIV, ESV, NISB, the JPS Tanakh, plus a whole host more. The context demands that Hag be translated in the English as a feast, not the feast. Malak Yahweh doesn't even... Uh, Malach Yahweh doesn't specify being it. It is simply a term that can be used of uh, a messenger of Yahweh. Uh, now, we have the, the Genesis 35, 35, 1, 6 and 7, where you went to uh, the plural. 
of uh, niglu. In uh, the reason that we have the plural niglu here appeared as in, in, in the plural is the context is pretty simple. If we understand that the scriptures are written for the reader to get a better understanding of the story, then it makes perfect sense. God, Ha Elohim, appeared to Jacob at Bethel. If we go back and look at uh, when God did so in chapter 28, we will see that God appeared to Jacob in a dream. In that dream, Jacob saw a ladder uh, that went from heaven to earth. On that ladder were angels ascending and descending. At the top of the ladder stood Yahweh, angels being God's messengers and representatives. In his dream in Genesis 31, Jacob is spoken to by the angel of the Lord. So the context in Genesis 35 is written in a way for the reader to understand that the revelation of Elohim, which is the uh, which we're, we're classing as Yahweh and his angels here, uh, was in the form of Yahweh and the angels who represented him. This actually helps better understand the relationship between Yahweh and the angels. Now, Targum, Jonathan, uh, Targum Jonathan here states, and he builded there an altar and named that place to God who had made his sh uh, Shekinah to dwell in Bethel because there had been revealed to him the angels of the Lord in his fight, uh, flight from his brother Esau. Uh, Targum Onkelos has angel of the Lord here. It's just a recognition of the connection between Yahweh and his angels. And now seeing his angels is seeing him. A bit like seeing Jesus is seeing, seeing him. Uh, continuing on with plural uh, language, Abraham was caused to wonder, and I know that you've used this in a, in a previous video, by the angel and God. Now, if the Malach Yahweh is a manifestation of God, then we should understand that some manifestation occurs when the exact same Hebrew is used of Haggai in Haggai 1.13 and the priests in Malachi 2.7. Uh, you went to Hag uh, Haggai. Uh, sorry, uh, Haggai. The Bible records two times when she spoke to Yahweh. Both times the scripture identifies this as the angel, but never, uh, but neither time is Hagar told uh, that, sorry, the second time is explicit that it, uh, that it was the angel of the Lord who spoke to Hagar from heaven. Verses, uh, verse Genesis 21, 17, and God heard the voice of the lad and the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven. When it comes to Genesis 16, the first time she speaks with Yahweh, verse 7 says the angel of the Lord found her. Now we know that the angel spoke in the first person that I, I will multiply thy seed for in verse 10. In verse 13, uh, she called the name of the Lord that spoke unto her, thou God seest me. For she said, have I also here looked after him that seeth me? Now, if we look at the Hebrew there, it states, I have seen the back of him that sees me. The Hebrew achar means the back part or hind part. Hagar saw what Moses saw in Genesis ex, uh, in Exodus 33, 22. Both words are from achar. Moses and Hagar saw a representation of God, not actually God himself, because God cannot be seen. Uh, you mentioned about worship. Okay, so the angel of the Lord is not uh, is not worshipped. It is through the angel of the Lord, the, the representation of the angel of the Lord, that the, the worship actually goes to the Father, uh, to, to God. Now, we, we would have a, a problem um, with uh, 
worship uh, with King David, who sent messengers to Abigail. And now she bowed her face to the earth in 1 Samuel 25, 41. In, in this verse, we have Shachar, Panim, and Eretz. Uh, and we also have to deal, we would have to deal with First Chronicles 29, 20. And David said to all the congregation, now bless the Lord your God. And all the congregation blessed the word, the Lord God of their fathers and bowed down their heads and worshipped the Lord and the king. So here we have the king being worshipped, but it's not being worshipped as God. It is worshipped as uh as the king here, not not as God, and the the angel of the Yahweh is not worshipped as God, but it is the representation of God. The uh, the worship goes to God. Uh, where else did you go? Um. <laughs> Oh, Isaiah 63, 7 and 14, um, the angel of his presence, the presence is uh, panim, the face of, uh, of his, the angel of his face. We know that God's face cannot be seen, Exodus 33, 20, his actual presence. So the angel is the representation of his face, his presence. The angel representing Yahweh is as if Yahweh is there as the authority of Yahweh is in the angel, which we have already established in Exodus 23, uh, 21. So seeing the angel is seeing God's face or rather the representation of. And so it's it's basically you, we, we understand the Exodus 23 uh, verses 20 to, through 23 as the explanation of how Yahweh is actually seen. All right. Um, thank you, LJ. And I will get Anthony back up on the screen now. <clears throat> All right. So... Anthony, if you could, uh, I'm sure you've already done it, but uh, if you haven't, turn your microphone back on. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have two 10-minute periods of cross-examination. The first 10 minutes, Anthony will be asking questions to LJ. And for the second 10 minutes, uh, LJ will be asking questions to Anthony. So, are uh, both of you ready? Yes. Um, yep. Yeah. All right, Anthony, you're still a little out of sync, but we do hear you hear you clearly, so should be fine. All right, All Anthony, right, whenever you're ready. You mean? I don't. I don't think there's anything uh, to do about it. But that, as long as we can hear you clearly, that's the main factor, and we hear you clearly, so that's good. Okay, LJ, just just uh, to get started, I mean, uh, I just want a clarification on something. Uh, do, mm -hmm. you know uh, do you know Hebrew? I've I'm learning Hebrew. I, I don't okay. know. He, I, so, I, I, I certainly wouldn't classify myself as um, an, an expert in Hebrew, but uh, I've, I've started to learn. Yeah. I, I, I asked that question because it was, uh, you know, I don't like to impute to somebody any ill uh, uh, behavior or anything like that. I don't think that you're, you know, it's lying or anything. I think you're being genuine when you make a claim, even if it's false. Uh, and the reason I'm, I'm saying this is because you said that the word Melach Yahweh uh, is definite and there's just no way to make it definite uh, or excuse me indefinite uh, you said it just it, it's just a you know accidental kind of thing it, there's just no other way in Hebrew but the fact is in Hebrew and I would like you to comment on this if you do want to say an angel of Yahweh you say Malak look Yahweh you add the Lamed preposition are you are you aware of that uh, where would you where would you uh, draw that from uh, any it's standard from... Hebrew uh, grammar uh, reference work, the, the Lamed preposition is how you would make the phrase indefinite. Okay, so there there are no times when translators or uh, have translated the the angel of the Lord, which Malach Yahweh as uh, angel, an angel of the Lord. Would that there, be an, no it would... standard? There... There's there's no standard translation that does that. But my observation has more to do with your claim that there's just no way to say an angel. There is a way to say angel, irrespective of whether you think the phrase itself, without the Lamed preposition, can be rendered indefinitely. 
Uh, but okay, so moving on, okay. uh, since you believe that angels uh, are representatives of God can, uh, and can be called by his name, can you give me an example of any other angel who is called God, Genesis 35, 1, like the angel of the Lord, or Yahweh, Genesis 16, 13, 28, 13, or the Lord God, like the angel of the Lord in Genesis or Judges 6, 22? Uh, can you give me an example of any uh, angel uh, b- besides the angel of the Lord who is called uh, by any divine title? The, but you're you're uh, asserting that that there is only one one angel that it, that it is. That's, um, that's, yeah, that's that's my next question. Uh, I, I argued in my opening that the angel of the Lord, the phrase is definite. Uh, you asserted that it it could uh, be indefinite just because there's no other no, way to say no, that. No, e- even if even if that. you even if you say the angel of the Lord, you're still referring to a specific uh, angel. That is representing God at that specific time. So it doesn't matter it, which angel it, it is at that specific time. Um, you would, right. it would always so, be the so angel would, of the Lord, like the priest. How, how, how would, how would you, how would you deal with the fact, uh, for example, that uh, like Judges two one, where the angel says, "I'm the one who brought you up out of Egypt, led you into the promised land, which I swore on oath to your forefathers." Here, the angel of the Lord identifies himself as the same one who swore the oath to Abraham, led them out of Egypt, led them into the promised land, where he was still with them at the time of the judges. Because we're 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 talking about um, the angel, and it is any angel that is representation of, of Yahweh at that specific okay. time. It, it, we don't need. Uh, to be a a specific angel, we're we're talking about the angel that is representing Yahweh at that specific time. Yeah. and, it, and it, it the angel be... at, the angel at that specific time identifies himself as the one who swore the oath to Abraham, led them out of Egypt into the promised land, and was with them at the time of the judges. Yeah, because we're we're talking about the representation of Yahweh at that specific time. So any uh, angel that is representing. Uh, uh, Yahweh at that specific time can identify himself as the angel who did that okay. because but, all angels would be would be they're all ministering spirits to us they they we don't need to, to differentiate at that specific time the angel of the Lord is um, is just an angel that has been that is in representation of of Yahweh. Right. You're, you're asserting that, but my point is that the text itself is identifying him as the same one across all of these accounts. In any case, in Psalm 34, it speaks of uh, the angel of the Lord as the object of David's fear and the one who encamps around him and rescues or saves him. Can you give me an example of any other angel uh, that, that is the object of the, righteous's, the righteous person's fear? We again, it, it, there's no there's no problem here to to state the angel of the Lord. It is the one that is representation of of Yahweh. When the other when the angel, the specific angel, is representing Yahweh at that specific time, he is the angel of the Lord. He is representing Yahweh at that specific time. The other angels so, so are not representing are you, God at that specific time, so they wouldn't are you, need to are you be asserting- called. This, this is a psalm or a prayer of David, in which case he's addressing, he's talking about the angel. The angel's not present, that he would be referring to him as a representative. But, but my point, okay, so you're, you're acknowledging that it's referring to a specific angel as the object of his fear. It's, um, it's can you referring an to a specific angel at that specific time. We don't, if, if an angel appears um, we, and they're representing Yahweh, then they are that, the angel of the Lord. That's... That's right. how and and properly, the the object of holy fear and the the one that they look to and trust in as their protector and, and savior and and rescuer and so, so forth. Well, the angel of the Lord does protect them. And, uh, but, okay. Uh, there are, but that is Yahweh uh, working through the angel. Okay. So yeah, in, we have we have other sa- Yahweh has other saviors that that, uh, that are not can you show the, me the any angel. other angel that. It, can you show me any other angel who's identified as the savior of Israel? But the angels are now not, uh, apart from Gabriel and Michael, they're not named because they're not representing themselves or they're not coming in um, in representation of themselves at that specific time. They're coming in the representation of Yahweh. There is, we're not talking about the angel and we're not talking about the name of the angel. We're talking about the name of Yahweh, which is in the angel that is represented. Okay. Can you give me an example of any other angel besides the angel? I mean, you keep asserting that, that this just refers to any old angel. 
but the, that's just not how it works in terms of all that I, I presented. And I'll come back to that in my rebuttal, but I just want to get out here some of your, your position. Uh, in Exodus 23, it says, my name is in him. Can you show mm-hmm. that stated of uh, anyone other than the angel of the Lord? Any other uh, angel? I know you're saying this can refer to any old angel, but I, so let's just uh, set aside this phrase and show me this in reference to angels in general. Can you show me, apart from this phrase, where anyone is identified as bearing the very name of God in their own being? Well, we're spe- if you're talking specific angels, yeah, or or, any, or anybody, or or anybody. Yeah, show show me show me anywhere where it says that uh, someone, uh, my name is in him, and this is the grounds why this person is to be obeyed and feared and submitted to, and why you're to recognize that he has the prerogative okay. to forgiveness because like, yeah. b- because that that's ex- explained in uh genesis uh, in exodus 23 is specifically explained the re- the, the representation that that, uh, that the angel has and it, it it we don't it can be one angel but we have uh new testament a- um attestation that uh in acts 753 that actually uh it was angels well okay we're debating the old testament but no that i don't agree with that on the new testament uh, reference but uh can you give me an example of anyone other than the angel of the lord who uh is sacrificed to in in genesis 22 for example the angel of the lord says you have not uh withheld your son your only son from me and the same thing can be seen in other cases can you give me an example of any other angel uh who is the object of sacrificial worship he, the the sacrifice didn't go to the angel. The angel was speaking in the first person as Yahweh. The the sacrifice was it was Yahweh that asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. It was uh, the the sacrifice that um, that Abraham can you, was. Can you give was, me? That wasn't going to the example? angel. That was going to Yahweh. I understand your answer. Can you give me an example where the appearance of a created angel becomes the occasion for giving the place a theophoric name? Like the Erla Chayroi, the Well of the Living and Seeing One, or Bethel, the the House of God, or Peniel, the Face of God. For example, uh, did Daniel erect an altar to them? Did he uh, rename the place where he was at in light of their appearance? Again, we're we're talking about the angel that is representing Yahweh, and that the, the it is not to the angel that those altars were built. This, it, it's to Yahweh. Yeah, it does, it's, it says uh, they're to build an altar there to God who appeared to you uh, yeah. in Genesis 35. So it was the angel who appeared to him, but it says God who appeared to you. So the altar was built to the angel of the Lord. Because and the Jacob angel... even says, surely the Lord is in this place. And it says that he, he uh, built, uh, anointed a pillar in, uh, uh, because he had seen God face to face. LJ can respond to that. And after that, we're, we're going to switch. Good. And and okay. seeing God face to face um, is not a literal thing. Um, there are many people who who claim to have seen God face to face, but they didn't see the face of God. God specifically says nobody can see my face. What they see is an angel that represents him. They see the angel that is the panim of Yahweh, the representation, the face. They that is the face of Yahweh. All right. Well, that uh, that wraps up our first round of cross examination. Anthony uh, cross examining uh, LJ, and now we're going to uh, reverse that. And LJ, you have ten minutes to cross examine Anthony. Okay. So. <clears throat> uh, okay. So, it is your belief that Jesus is not an actual angel. Is that is that correct? Uh, the, the- you say an actual angel the hebrew and greek term yeah. both just mean messenger Only I, the i'm talking about determined. i'm talking about the the specific english term angel he's uh, not so, an angel uh, if if the word angel is being used as a reference to a created messenger then yes i believe uh, jesus is not uh, an angel in that sense okay so in one of your videos you quoted gunther um, uh, Juncker. Uh, a fairly persuasive case can be made that the Malach in the Old Testament does not mean angel at all, at least not in the modern sense of the distinct uh, created uh, creaturely spirit. In, instead, the word only means presence or manifestation. 
Now, I agree that Malak does not necessarily uh, denote what uh, Gunther attested, uh, a distinct creaturely spirit. Would you then say that Angel as uh, is an incorrect rendering of Malach Yahweh, because Angel in a modern sense of the word is that of a distinct creaturely spirit? Uh, so, uh, okay, if we're going by the inspired text, which uses Malach, the, the term just conveys the sense of somebody bearing a message. So if we, in English, restrict the word angel to a created testimony, then I would say that's an improper rendering. But I think that anybody who's reading the Bible knows they're reading a translation. Uh, and and I, the translators recognize how that term is being used. That's why, for example, there's debate among scholars when it comes to Revelation 2 and 3, when Jesus dictates letters to the seven churches and says to the angel of the church of Thyatira or Pergamum or whatever. Uh, some people say, well, that's referring to the pastor of those congregations. Other people say it's referring to an angel that watches over those congregations. That's because the term has no ontological import. The same thing is true in Malachi 3.1, where it says, I'll send my messenger before me, which is interpreted in, in the New Testament as John the Baptist preparing the way before Jesus. Obviously, John the Baptist is not a heavenly creature. Mm -hmm. He is rather a, just a human messenger. Okay. So what would you say that the angel of the Lord is ontologically? Yahweh. So just ontologically Yahweh. The angel of the Lord is Yahweh, like uh, Moses said in Genesis sixteen thirteen. She gave this name to Yahweh, who spoke to her. Okay, or so as Hosea so, said in twelve five when he said Yahweh is his memorial name. Okay, so specifically Yahweh. So, yeah. if this is just Yahweh, why would we need to make the distinction between Yahweh and the Malach Yahweh? If because this is God just exists in more than God exists in more than one person. Now, one thing I didn't say in my opening, since you've pointed out uh, a number of, you know, you quoted Gunther Junker. I thank you for doing that, by the way, because you quoted a scholar who agrees with me. But uh, numerous scholars point out, I mean, you've got different kinds of construct relationships in Hebrew. In my view, the construct relationship, uh, Melach Yahweh, is an appositional construct. This is pointed out by Douglas Stewart, for example, in his commentary on Exodus. An appositional construct means that the second term defines the first term. So it literally means the messenger, Yahweh, or the messenger who is Yahweh. So this particular individual is that member of the Godhead who specifically appears to men and reveals uh, the will of God. Okay. So why does, the, um, does Jesus never mention the fact that he was the angel of the Lord back in the Old Testament. But the Old Testament doesn't comment on everything in the Old Testament. For example, it doesn't interpret the plurals in Genesis 126, 322, 11:7, Isaiah 6, 8. It doesn't explicitly quote Isaiah 9, 6 in reference to Jesus, that he'll be the mighty God. There's numerous passages in the Old Testament that aren't dealt with in the New. However, I don't think that means that there is no indication in the New Testament. Uh, I already cited an example of this in Malachi 3, 1. Malachi, the, the Lord says, I'll send my messenger before me, and then uh, he'll prepare my way. And then he says, and then the Lord, Ha'adon, a title exclusively used for God, the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, the angel of the covenant. So here the Lord is referred to as the messenger of the covenant, the angel of the covenant. That is applied explicitly to Jesus in uh, Mark chapter 1, and it's uh, applied explicitly to Jesus in Matthew 11. So Jesus is identified as the angel of the covenant. He's, and there's other evidences. There, there's other evidences, but we're not debating the New Testament or whether or not Jesus is the angel of the Lord. So that would be my short answer. Okay. So in Zechariah chapter 2, the angel of the Lord is given instructions um, by what? Uh, by uh, uh, another angel. Uh, can you explain why the need for the angel of the Lord to be uh, instructed by another angel that uh, appears to him and explains to him that he must um, tell Zechariah uh, some where does some where does Zechariah two say the angel where does Zechariah two say the angel of the Lord in Zechariah two yes. Uh, Zechariah 2 I can already tell you it doesn't use that phrase 
I doesn't it doesn't say the angel of the Lord. It, it, no, it, it, you're correct because the angel of the Lord is the one that is already um, speaking to Zachariah. The uh, and and it says that. Um, well, where does it the, say that the, the angel of the Lord is the one that's in view here that was talking to Zechariah? Because it's the same angel that was speaking to Zechariah in chapter 1. Uh, but where does it say in chapter 1 that, that the, the, the chapter 1 does mention the angel of the Lord, but it mentions multiple angels. It, it talks about interactions between angels. So where does it specifically uh, determine that the one in view in Zechariah 2 is that uh, the angel of the Lord? Uh, because it says that the the angel that that it was speaking to. Um... Uh, so let me let me help here in a second. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In verse nope. nine, it says, "I asked, what are these, my lord?" And it says, "The angel who was talking with me answered, I will show you uh, what they are.'" Then the man standing among the myrtle trees explained, "They are the ones the Lord has sent to go throughout the earth." And they reported to the angel of the Lord. So the one speaking to Zechariah is a different angel. In Zechariah uh, 2, the angel of the Lord is the one that was speaking to Zechariah. The angel okay. comes okay. to the angel that was speaking to Zechariah and you're, gives you're him information. The angel of, of the Lord and then he, also speak, the then he also says, thus saith the Lord. Well, where is that? And besides that, I mean, even if the angel of the Lord ever uses that particular language, that's not problematic. I'm a Trinitarian, not a Unitarian. The angel of the Lord can refer to the Lord because God is not unipersonal. Mm -hmm. Okay. If Malach Yahweh is demonstrably uh, not a unique title for the being known as the angel of the Lord, uh, if talking in the first person uh, as the angel of uh, as Yahweh is demonstrably not unique to th this being and the actions performed by uh, another are attributed to Yahweh having performed them is demonstrably not unique to this being without reading a preconceived belief back into the text on what basis should we ass uh, assert that the angel of the Lord is in fact Yahweh well that's question begging you've asked me a question uh, you know, if it's demonstrably the case that the angel of the Lord is not distinct, determinate, uh, unique person, which I argued in my opening and hasn't been refuted yet, then you're asking me a question predicated on that. But I don't grant that assumption. I, I, I did show yeah. that I did show where the angel of the, uh, where other people are, do speak in the first person, where the attributes of Yahweh um, doing something, the actions are uh, the, the person that is doing them. The actions are attributed to Yahweh. So I did show that. You're talking about whether the angel of the Lord was a, a definite title for a specific individual. Now, now you're talking about the issue of representation, right? Yeah, yeah I admit well, that you showed cases of representation when it comes to others. What I don't grant is that you've demonstrated this in the case of the angel of the Lord. For example, no, so, you, oh, you're trying to ask questions. Uh, yeah, what I'm saying is that if it is demonstrably shown that other people uh, or others do what is oh. attributed to the angel of the Lord, uh, on what basis do we say that the angel of the Lord is not the same as these other uh representatives yeah although they yeah the, so I don't, the angel of the lord I, specific it, he's a specific angel but human beings are different than angels the, the representation is different through through uh angels and human beings so what basis do we do that on on the angel of the lord all right uh anthony yeah, we're, we're anthony we're at 10 minutes so after you answer this then we'll then we'll move on okay yeah i don't grant that you find the same phenomena in the case of others there's any number of differences between what we see in the case of the angel of the Lord and other individuals. It's one thing to say that a prophet who ordinarily distinguishes himself from God would sometimes uh, just speak, uh, just start speaking uh, the words of God in the first person. What you see in the case of the angel of the Lord is he always does that. He always explicitly identifies himself as God, is identified as God by others, and even by the narrators of Scripture. He's also uh, rendered the kind of worship that is exclusive to God, not just the term bowing down or something like that, which you pointed out uh, in reference to, uh, uh, you know, people bowing down to the king or something like that. The angel is, uh, altars are erected to him. 
Uh, theophoric names are given to the places. Uh, they remove their sandals in his presence. They fear that they've seen him and are going to die because they've seen God. All right. Thank you, LJ and Anthony, for our two rounds of cross-examination. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have uh, a five-minute rebuttal from each participant. And we're going to begin with Anthony. LJ, if you could silence your microphone while I put Anthony up on the screen by himself. Let me restart my timer here. And Anthony, you have five minutes whenever you're ready to begin. Okay, so uh, in his opening presentation, uh, and uh, also I'll address his rebuttal here as well, uh, but LJ mentioned that uh, this is why he doesn't like to go outside of the Bible. He was suggesting that, uh, uh, you know, I was doing that, whereas clearly my case is ultimately based on Scripture. Uh, but, but notice that LJ appealed to Tobias Singer. He appealed to William Lane Craig. He's referring to the law of agency and using it in a way that was developed by Talmudic Jews. I disagree with their application of it to the angel of the Lord. All of this is appealing to things outside of the Bible. There's a relevant way to bring up extra biblical material, and, and, and that doesn't mean that a person is basing their case on these things. But I think that what LJ has done uh, is illicit. It's irrelevant if Tobias Singer uh, you know, believes something or if William Lane Craig does, if we're doing a debate. It doesn't, you know, you can quote people that agree with you. Uh, but he, he mentions things like, uh, you know, other Targums mention different interpretations. I don't deny that. But the point was, when I brought up the Targum, is that there were pre-Christian Jews who recognized divine plurality. For example, he was talking about Genesis 126 and how Certain Targums refer to the angels, but here's the Jerusalem Targum, the one actually used in Palestine by the Jews. It says, the word of the Lord created man in his likeness, the Memra. So the one the Hebrew text says God was speaking to, let us make, is identified in the Targum as the word, even as the word is used as a title elsewhere in the Targums for the angel of the Lord. So my point wasn't that there weren't other Jews who held different interpretations at particular points, my point was there were Jews who recognized this in the Old Testament, the very thing that LJ says uh, couldn't be found and can't be done. Uh, in uh, Genesis 48, uh, I'd really be interested in hearing more from LJ what he thinks here. The, the, his answer, to, uh, in my mind, was very convoluted. He, he, it sounded to me like he was saying Jacob doesn't know who the angel is, doesn't know he's referring to. I don't want to misrepresent LJ, I, so I just want to reaffirm uh, the point that I made. In Hebrew, grammatically, there's no question what's going on here. Jacob says, the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walk, the God who's been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who redeemed me from all evil, may he bless the lads. The uh, the, the verb in Hebrew is singular. It's forestalled to the end of the sentence, and it ties together all of these descriptive phrases. And it is saying that the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, was the angel or shepherd and redeemer of Jacob. And he's praying to the angel. He's invoking the angel to bless his descendants. If this is just a created angel, then Jacob is an idolater. Unitarianism uh, reduces the Old Testament figures to uh, uh, being idolaters. Uh, he said numerous times that the uh, he made a number of Hebrew errors about the phrase, the angel of the Lord. I pointed out that the phrase is not indefinite, and it's not true to say that it couldn't be rendered indefinite in Hebrew. Melach le Yahweh is exactly how you do that, and that's exactly what the Old Testament text does not do when it comes to the angel of the Lord. By the way, when he gives examples of other construct relationships like uh, Exodus 10.9 about a feast, I don't agree that the context demands that it be rendered a feast, even if somebody would translate it that way. Uh, he said that uh, the verb is plural in Genesis 35. Uh, I pointed out in Genesis 35, 1, that God told Jacob, go and build an altar in Bethel to God who appeared to you, or God speaks about God as the one who appeared to him. And then in verse 7, it uses the plural verb saying they revealed themselves to him. He says this just refers to angels. That is not at all possible in light of the Hebrew text. The subject of the sentence to which the plural refers is God. It says their God revealed themselves to him. It's referring to God, not to angels. Uh, when, with respect to Hagar in, in Genesis 16, he, he made an observation here that I actually agree with, but I don't know for the life of me how he got the conclusion that he got. He said that when Hagar says, I have seen uh, him, he, she literally says, I have seen uh, his receding part, his back. Uh, but then he connects it to Exodus 33, 
where the one in view, uh, it says that Moses sees God's back because God says, you can't behold my glory and live. So notice what he's done here. Uh, he, he's actually made part of my case for me. In Exodus 33, it's very clear that Moses is saying, Lord, Yahweh, show me your glory. And God says, I'll show you my back. LJ points out that's what happens in the case of Hagar and the angel of the Lord, thus making as clear an identification of the angel of the Lord as Yahweh as could possibly uh, be made. Uh, he, he mentioned the issue of worship. He says that uh, uh, it's not the angel who's worshipped, it's the father who's being worshipped through him. Where does the Old Testament text ever say that? He talks about reading things into the Old Testament text. Here's a colossal example of that. The Old Testament never says that the, angel, that the worship being directed to the angel of the Lord is being rendered to God. In fact, it explicitly says otherwise. When Jacob erects a pillar, he's explicitly told to erect it to the one who appeared to him. Time's up. Right. Your time was up 20 seconds ago, so... Um. <laughs> oh, I wasn't looking. All right, uh, LJ, if you could... LJ, if you could turn your mic back on, and Anthony, if you could turn yours off... LJ Anthony did go 20 seconds over and so it's okay you have a you have a 20 you have a free 20 second mm -hmm. buffer if you want to go 520 that is uh that is entirely up to you I will I will hold I will uh I will hold my hand up just as I did with Anthony at five minutes but understand that you could take a you know you could take an extra 15 to 20 seconds uh, if you need it um other than that let me get you up on the screen here and all right, we have you up on the screen. I have my watch reset, so you have five minutes whenever you're ready to begin. Okay, so um, I brought up Tovia Singer, um, not to actually appeal to Tovia Singer or William Lane Craig. That was actually just to lead into um, the fact that uh, Anthony claims that the if the uh, the Trinitarian God is not revealed in the Old Testament, then it is a different God. It, it's, it was literally just to show that there are Trinitarians that do not believe that and to lead into um, into Anthony's belief. That was, that was the only reason I did that. In Genesis 35, it specifically says Elohim there. Um, and when we go back to, uh, to Genesis 28, it is actually Yahweh and the angels that um, that uh, uh, appear to uh, to Isaac uh, uh, to Jacob. There, it is the reference there to Elohim. Yahweh says uh, that where Elohim appeared to you. So it is a reference back to the to Genesis 28 when the Elohim were revealed to him. Uh, now, I'd like to go to the word of the Lord um, because there's been a, a little bit of connection between the, the word of the Lord here. Um, now, to suggest that the word of the Lord is a person uh, in the Old Testament and is actually connected to the uh, the the angel of the Lord is nothing more than inference. It is uh, an assumption based on reading the preconceived belief back into the texts. The word of the Lord is the communication or the message of the Lord. It can be applied to uh, the mean, uh, to mean the message uh, given by the Lord, or it can be applied to the way in which it is given. The angel of the Lord uh, is the means that the word being given when the angel of the lord comes to a person this can be recorded as the word of the lord coming or appearing to that said person the uh as the angel speaks or um brings the words of god that he is given to speak it isn't the angel that is uh the word of the lord but, but he is the one that comes or appears and speaks the word of the Lord. When God gave a message to one of his prophets to speak to another, they are the word of the Lord coming to that person. And uh, we can go to scripture here. Um, First Chronicles eleven thirteen. Wherefore came all the elders of Israel to the king to Hebron, and David made a covenant with them in Hebron before the Lord, and they 
anointed David king over Israel according to the word of the Lord by Samuel. Same thing in 2 Kings 9.36, wherefore they came and again told him and said, this is the word of the Lord, which he spake by his servant Elijah the Tishbite. Haggai in Haggai 1.1, in the second year of Darius, the king in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel. In chapter 8 of 1 Samuel, we are told that the Israelites uh, rejected the two sons of Samuel. They, uh, they want a king. Uh, God says that they, um, to Samuel that they have not rejected Samuel, they have rejected him. Uh, God then tells Samuel to tell the Israelites all the bad things that would come about by them having a king. In, uh, it states that they refused to obey Samuel's voice. Samuel spoke what God told him to say. So again, they rejected the, vo the word of the Lord. They rejected uh, what God said, but God didn't say it. Samuel did. It, the word of the Lord came through Samuel. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, uh, the worship um, and the, the, to bow down. That's not what the text says. Uh, it actually says that they worshipped Yahweh and the king. Uh, in First Chronicles, I think it was. Uh, First Chronicles 29.20. It actually says that they worshipped uh, Yahweh and the king. Okay, uh, I, I'll, I'll pass over. All right, one second here. And all right, so ladies and gentlemen, that wraps up our rebuttals. We will now have a uh, conclusion or summation uh, from each side. These will be five minutes each, and then we will take some questions from the chat. So if you have questions, get those ready. Um, you'll want to get them ready because once we actually go to questions, that's when you'll want to post them to give, you know, give yourself the best chance of me seeing it once we go to the uh, Q&A. So again, five minutes each right now. Let me get Anthony up on the screen by himself. And uh, LJ, if you could mute your mic. Anthony, is your mic unmuted? I don't hear you. Yes. Okay. All right, Anthony, you have five-minute conclusion whenever you're ready. All right. LJ, again, referred to Genesis 35, and I, you know, through probably no fault of his own, I think he's, he's just trying to do the best he can to make the text jive with uh, Unitarianism. Uh, however, Unitarianism is a fickle partner. The Bible simply uh, is going to step all over its toes. In Genesis 35, it does not refer to the angels as uh, the ones that appeared, although I don't deny that there were angels present. The point in Genesis 35, 7 is that the verb that's in the plural is referred to God. It's God who's referred to in the plural. And God himself, in the first verse of the same chapter, refers to God as the one who appeared to Jacob. So in, in both of these ways, more than one divine person is being identified. When we look at Genesis 28, Genesis 31, and Genesis 35, we see that the text goes back and forth between referring to the one who appeared as Yahweh or the angel of Yahweh. Uh, and this accounts then for the, the plural. Uh, now, he spent the bulk of his time, and I'm not really sure why, uh, on the word of the Lord. I think it's appropriate to address that because, he, uh, because I did bring it up at, at a point simply to show that this is how the uh, Jews in the uh, pre-Christian period interpreted or understood the angel of the Lord. Uh, but uh, the fact of the matter is, uh, you know, you can't simply say, well, sometimes the phrase, the word of the Lord, just refers to what was spoken to someone or what was spoken through someone. I certainly grant that. Uh, but but it, it's a mistake to say just because a phrase is used one way in one place that it must be, mean that in another place. It's always the context that determines it. For example, if it talks about lambs being slaughtered, 
and that refers to literal lambs. That doesn't mean when the New Testament calls Jesus the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, that it must refer to actual animals. The word can be used in different contexts in different ways with different applications. The same thing is true with respect to the phrase, the word of the Lord. When you look, for example, at Genesis 15, it says that the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. This refers to Abraham seeing the word. This isn't merely something that Abraham's hearing. Moreover, it goes on to say that he took Abraham outside and said to him, look up at the sky and so forth. The idea of a word appearing and being seen to Abram and also doing this activity of taking him outside shows that this is not being used in the way uh, that it might sometimes be used in other cases. Uh, now, he also brought up again the idea of worship, but it was LJ uh, who pointed out that in the context of First Chronicles 29, when it says they worship Yahweh and the king, that it doesn't refer to divine worship. He grants, like I do, that this is not divine worship because the king is not God. But in any case, in my view, there are certain acts of worship that are exclusive to Yahweh, and not just in my view, but in uh, the, the, the biblical text. For example, in 2 Kings 17, it says, uh, to this day, speaking of Israel, they persist in their former practices. They neither worship the Lord nor adhere to the decrees and regulations, the laws and commands that the Lord God gave the descendants of Jacob, whom he named Israel. When the Lord made a covenant with the Israelites, he commanded them, do not worship any other gods or bow down to them, serve them or sacrifice to them. But the Lord who brought you up out of Egypt with mighty power and outstretched arm is the one you are to worship. So they are not to worship anyone else's God, and they are not to render specifically the act of sacrifices to them. But as I've shown numerous times, this is precisely the kind of worship that the angel received. He is called God. He is worshipped as God. Sacrifices are rendered to him. Genesis 22, Judges 6, Judges 13. Pillars and altars are erected to him. Genesis 28, Genesis 35. He's worshipped over and over again. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, LJ says that God can't be seen. Uh, and so any appearance then that scripture mentions of God, it must be the angel of the Lord. That would mean then that uh, when we see Isaiah uh, talking about the Lord in his heavenly temple being surrounded by the seraphim, and Isaiah said he saw the king, the Lord of hosts, with his own eyes, that it was actually the angel of the Lord. But what's taking place in that passage? What's taking place is the angels are worshiping him. They're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So even the angels are worshiping this figure. Uh, and uh, this would be true throughout the biblical text. In fact, this points up a very serious problem that is going to just plague Unitarianism in all forms of Unitarianism, really. If you make the, uh, if you say that none of these appearances are in fact God himself, even though scripture says, uh, while it's ordinarily the case somebody would die, God could spare someone as he did in the case of Jacob and Israel. Uh, I already read those texts. Uh, if you say that it's never God who is appearing, never God who's the one doing the saving action, never God who's the one uh, who's uh, speaking and interacting with people, then what you do is you eventually, you basically turn the religion of the Bible into the philosophy of Plato, who said there was this demiurge between God and people who had to act as an intermediary for him. And I'll conclude with that. All right. Thank you, Anthony. And please mute your microphone now. And LJ, if you could unmute your microphone, I'll get you up on the screen. And LJ, you, well, let me reset my timer. You have five minutes and then we will be done with our debate proper and we'll move on to some questions from the chat. So whenever you're ready. Uh, I would be if I could find what I was actually looking for. <laughs> Take your time. Okay, so um, I'm actually going to concentrate um, a, a little bit on um, on the worship side of it of, of this um, because I, I didn't really get into um, to the worship uh, and and Anthony brought up uh, a little bit here uh, and he he went to um, some of the the worship that that was. Uh, and, and sacrifice that was given to the angel of the Lord, and um, he brought up, uh, not specifically, but um, the the sacrifice that um, that Gideon that Gideon gave. Uh, to understand that, we we need to fully look at the context, not just a small selection, uh, and analyze what the text says. A study of uh, a Manoah as well in Judges 13 is also needed, but I don't have time now. So. 
a quick backstory. The Israelites have fallen away from the uh, from following God and the practicing uh, Baal worship. They have been under the uh, the invasion of traveling nations such as the Midianites and Amalekites for about seven years. They would come every harvest and pillage the crops. Israel, uh, in uh, destitution, calls out to Yahweh. Yahweh is uh, going to use Gideon to rid Israel of its invaders. So Yahweh sends the angel of the Lord to meet with Gideon, who is basically a nobody in Israel and has no power or sway. He is just uh, a young man from the tribe of uh, Manasseh. In verse 12, the angel of the Lord appears to Gideon and tells him that Yahweh, not I am with you, but Yahweh is with you. You here is singular and he is speaking specifically to Gideon uh, and he calls him a mighty man of valor. This is prophetic for what he would become, what God saw in him. It's important to understand that Gideon thinks that the angel is just a man. He won't know that he is an angel until the end of the passage. In verse 13, Gideon replies, O oh my Lord, and he uses Adonai, uh, Adonai, master. He recognizes the authority of the man he is talking to. He asks the man if Yahweh is with us. Gideon uses the plural. He does not understand what the angel meant. Him, he, he thought that they meant that he meant Israel. If Yahweh is with us, why has he forsaken them and allowed the Midianites to come against them? If Yahweh be with us, not if you be with us. He is not calling the angel of the Lord Yahweh. It's likely he would um, have thought of him as a prophet. Now in verse 14, Yahweh through the angel told Gideon to go in this might and that Gideon would save Israel. Uh, have I not sent you? The angel switches to the first person speaking the words of Yahweh. Verse 15, Gideon asks how, seeing he is uh, the least in his family and they are poor. In verse 16, Yahweh tells him he is with Gideon and Gideon, with Gideon and Gideon will smite the Midianites as if they were one man. In verse 17, Gideon wants a sign that Yahweh is talking to him. He doesn't think that the man in front of him is Yahweh. He wants to make sure that the man in front of him is speaking from Yahweh. And so he asks for a sign. And in verse 18, Gideon says he is going to get a gift and ask the man to stay till he gets back uh, and the man agrees. Verse 19, Gideon makes a meal, a goat, some unleavened bread and broth. This is not a sacrifice or offering to God. Gideon still thinks uh, that this is a prophet or a man. The Hebrew, give, uh, the Hebrew gift uh, or present is mincha and is an offering that can simply mean a, a hospitality offering to a stranger. Gideon is giving a hospitality offering, not a sacrifice to Yahweh. Gideon re, uh, prepared the goat, he cooked it. There is no sacrificial law where a person would bring a cooked goat uh, as an offering to God. To assert that uh, a sacrifice here is being given to, would be given to Yahweh is to completely misrepresent the laws of sacrifice. Gideon built no altar. The goat is not sacrificed on an altar, and he puts the meal under the tree for the man. And in verse 20, the angel told him to put the food on a rock. Gideon does so at the request of the man. Verse 21, the angel of the Lord touched the food with his staff and fire rose from out of it and the rock consumed the food. It was the fire that uh, that is stated as having consumed the food. Gideon would have uh, recognized this as the sign. Interestingly, that um, this is very similar to when ya uh, Moses did this uh, with the rock and with the, the with the sea. And I don't have time to finish that off. But. All right. Thank you, LJ. Anthony, if you could unmute your microphone. Thank you to both gentlemen for a very respectful debate. We are going to take some questions from the chat now. And uh, please, if you can, tell me which person, which participant your question is for. And 
Um, that way I can, that way, that'll help me in uh, trying to go back and forth on questions. Um, all right, so post your questions now, ladies and gentlemen, and I will do my best to get through as many as possible. Um, and also, also, uh, Anthony and LJ, if you guys, uh, if you can see the live stream and you can see the chat, then if you see any questions that you'd like to draw attention to for uh, for each other, I'd be happy to give you that opportunity to raise uh, those questions. I can't see the the live chat, so uh, okay. I then to, Anthony, you can't. Along. Then Anthony, you can't do it either. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we do have a. Uh, 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 multiple people are bringing up the question of Zechariah 3, 3 through 4. Uh, and Protestant Believer says it's question for both. Zechariah 3, 3 through 4. Um, how can the angel who is in heaven forgive sins? And let me find Shamunian. Uh, yeah, actually, it looks like five or six people are bringing this up. So Isaac Marshall here says in regards to Zechariah 3, 3 through 4, how can the angel who is in heaven forgive sins and he's actually pointing out that uh sam shamoon asked this question as well so who would like to go first on this since it's directed towards both uh i'll i'll allow uh, anthony to go first seeing all right go ahead anthony. okay oh and, and guys right, uh, yeah, so me, guys what, guys we, we don't we haven't uh, we haven't laid down any rules uh, as far as time here so i'll just ask everyone to to do their best in being respectful with time and you know if you uh want to take a minute or two that's fine but uh you know try to keep it as short as you can yeah so i would point out a number of things along with the fact that the angel of the lord forgives his sins uh in in uh, the first verse it says then he showed me joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the lord and satan standing at his right side to accuse him the lord said to satan the lord rebuke you satan the lord who has chosen jerusalem so here, the angel of the Lord is explicitly referred to as the Lord, Yahweh, and he says, Yahweh rebuke you, Satan. So here in this very context, you have a reference to two persons called Yahweh, one of whom is further identified as the angel of the Lord. And as you go through the context, the angel says, see, I have forgiven your uh, iniquity. I have uh, removed your sin from you and so forth. So here you have the angel of the Lord called Yahweh in heaven, where you wouldn't ha have any need for a representative for God, and he's doing a divine act, he's forgiving sins. So this figure appears in the Old Testament, he appears in the form of a man, he descends from heaven to earth, he has authority on uh, to forgive sins, uh, and so on and so forth. To me, the identity of this figure is quite obvious. All right, LJ, your response? Uh, my response to this is uh, an honest response that um, this this passage is not one that I've I've studied in enough detail to be able to give an, an accurate uh, answer to. Um, I would still assert that the the text is showing that it is through the the angel of the Lord um, that the the representation um, of God is. Uh, we still need the angel of the Lord in the, for representation for the text to understand what is go, what is going on. Um, but it is one that um, I would need to to look into okay. a little bit more um, to give an honest answer um, at that. That's not uh, a, a passage that has been brought up to me before, um, so it's not one that I've um, specifically could answer. Mm -hmm. um, uh, sorry about that. But. Oh, and, and by the way, that is that is uh, that is no problem. It's it's I actually I actually respect it more when people say, you know, I haven't really thought about that. I don't want to blurt out an answer until I've actually mm -hmm. thought about that rather than some people have a natural instinct to blurt out an answer and and uh, without without thinking caref carefully about it. All right. Here's a question for Anthony. Um, I want to know, is Dr. Rogers, is, is he affirming that Yahweh on his throne in heaven is an angel or if Yahweh only revealed himself as an angel to the prophets he referenced. So is, is Yahweh on his throne a messenger, or is it only when uh, Yahweh appears in, in some fashion? Yeah, so the, the word angel, again, doesn't denote uh, the particular kind of being that's in view. It simply refers to someone who speaks, someone who conveys a message. 
I pointed out in my opening that this term is used for God in the Old Testament, just like it's used for the heavenly host and is used for human beings. Malachi 3.1 shows an example of it being used uh, for uh, human being as well as for the Lord himself. So uh, to say that the angel of the Lord seated on the throne is uh, Yahweh doesn't mean that uh, he's a created angel. It means precisely that he is uh, that divine person who ordinarily represents or speaks uh, for the Godhead. He is that divine person. And the text, I just remind you, the text explicitly calls him Yahweh in heaven. It says, the Lord said, the Lord rebuke you. That's the one seated on the throne, the one referred to as the angel of the Lord, the one before whom uh, uh, Joshua is standing, the one who says, see, I have taken away your iniquity. All right, now question for, question for LJ. Um, this is... Yeah, this isn't exactly dealing with the angel of the Lord, but um, uh, hey, LJ, Colossians 2.9 says, For in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily, um, yet you denied the divinity of, divinity of Christ. Why? So I guess this is, uh, if you want to just, yeah, you can answer that. Um, uh, it's not really relevant to the actual debate, to be quite honest, whether um, the div whether that is in Jesus um, or not, that's that's not a relevant question to to whether um, whether whether Jesus whether whether the, the Trinity is true, mm -hmm. whether um, Jesus is God. Mm -hmm. um, that's that is it, it doesn't it wouldn't prove that Jesus was the angel of the Lord or that the angel of the Lord was mm -hmm. Yahweh. Yeah, we have. Uh, it, it, it's not. It, it wouldn't necessitate that Yahweh would be the angel of the Lord, or the angel of the Lord would be Yahweh, just because uh, the, the Trinity would be true. Yeah, and we actually, so, I think we addressed that at the very beginning that there are there there are Trinitarians who would deny that the that the angel of the Lord is mm -hmm. is Jesus and so on. Uh, all right, here's a question for both of you. Um, yeah. Oh, whoops. All right. So yeah, some of these are. Uh, some of these are kind of off topic as far as the angel of the Lord, but they're they're relevant as far as uh, to you know, I guess some of what you guys have been talking about. So, uh, is the creator? This question for both: Is the creator referred to? I guess you could just give a short you know yes or no or brief explanation. But is the creator referred to in John one three? Uh, the same creator referred to in Genesis two four. Um, so is the creator referred to in? John 3, all, all things were created uh, through him. Uh, is that the same creator as Genesis 2-4? Any thoughts on that? Uh, for me, oh, okay, it, well, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let, um, let, let, let you go. Okay, yeah, I mean, uh, I will say in agreement with LJ, this is technically off topic for our debate. It's relevant, obviously, to both of us. Uh, I'll give an answer, and I f fully understand if LJ just wants to say, you know, this is this is out of the purview of our debate. Uh, yes, I would say there's only one creator. That one creator, though, is triune, and that one creator is identified as the Father, His Word, or Son, and His Spirit. So in Genesis uh, 1 through 2, it refers to the Lord. In that same context, God is referred to or refers to others along with Him as involved in this creative process, let us make man in our image, uh, and it's not referring to angels. Uh, angels aren't creators. Uh, and, and then when John 1, 1 uh, through 18 speaks of the Word as the one by whom God made all things, uh, it, it's clearly talking about the same one in view in Genesis 1. Uh, your thoughts on that, LJ? Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll give a quick answer. I'm, I, I won't I'll skip over it uh, as Anthony did answer it. Um, the creator... Uh, is the same creator yeah the, the word um we're, we're talking about the word which um god spoke um god said let there be uh so the word i would agree is uh the creator god's word uh, as he spoke um creation into existence um i also will agree with anthony that um, genesis 126 is not talking about angels um so yeah all right, uh, question from Samuel Lane. Uh, question for Mr. Rogers. <laughs> Mr. Rogers. I just noticed it. How have I never noticed that? You're Mr. Rogers. Question for Mr. Rogers. Why do you... Welcome to my neighborhood. Why do you identify... G I guess it's a straightforward question. Why do you identify Jesus as the angel of the Lord? So I guess, you know, why not, uh, you know, 
the spirit or something like that. Well, so in the first place, the angel of the Lord is distinguished from the Father and the Holy Spirit in Isaiah 63 quite explicitly. It says that the Lord, who's identified in the context as the Father, you have there an explicit reference to the Father, and it says he saved Israel at the Exodus by means of the angel of his presence and his Holy Spirit he set in the midst of them. So the angel of the Lord is distinguished from the Father and the Spirit in a saving context, by the way. Uh, but moreover, I mean, there's any number of ways I can show the connection between the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament and Jesus in the New Testament. For example, in uh, Judges 13, uh, the angel of the Lord is explicitly asked, what is your name? And he says, why do you ask my name? It is wonderful. The word literally means beyond comprehension. He's telling uh, the questioner, my name is beyond your ability to understand or grasp. And what's interesting is that word is used exclusively for God or things that God does and for the coming Messiah. For example, in uh, Isaiah 9, 6, it says his name. This is the name by which he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So the uh, the coming Messiah is given the same divine title that's given to the angel of the Lord in Judges 13. And uh, moreover, this was also recognized by the Jews, because if you look at the Septuagint, translation by Jews into Greek, they actually translate the passage by paraphrasing it, and they say, this is the name by which he will be called, the angel of great counsel. So they recognize that this is a reference to the angel of the Lord coming in the flesh in the future as the Messiah. All right. Um, question for LJ. Oh, whoops. Actually, I had a different one I wanted to, where to go. Actually, let me put this one up. Um, Ariel Gonzalez says, who does Jacob Russell, God Almighty or the angel? So if the angel isn't God, uh, who does Jacob Russell with, God or the angel? He wrestles with God through the angel. He, he, I, actually, the, the text um, states that uh, he he wrestled with a man, so it's it would be clear that Jacob believed that this was simply a man that he wrestled with. Um, he does say that he saw God uh, face to face, uh, and again, we, we have to go back to the, the fact that God's face cannot be seen, which we see in Exodus 33, uh, and that the angel is the face of God, the angel is the representation of God. Um, but obviously Hosea 12.4 does... Uh, state that it that it specifically was an angel um and again so uh, I, I this is just a, a representation of god um, and I, so there's no need for um this to to literally be to be god um if god can't be seen uh and is invisible um it, it would be an impossibility for um jacob to actually wrestle with a physical god so it has to be a representative all right uh question uh, uh dennis will uh question for anthony do you refer jude 9 to zechariah 3 1 and 2 the angel of the lord would be the archangel michael there right no in fact, though, I think uh, Jude is a great place to go to further establish the identity of Jesus as the angel of the Lord, because in verse 4, uh, it, it says, uh, it, it speaks of uh, Jesus as our only sovereign and Lord. It uses the word despotes, the, the word for sovereign used for God in Acts 4, for example. It says he's our only sovereign and Lord. And then verse 5 says, though you already know all this, I want to remind you that although Jesus at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, later he destroyed those who did not believe. So Jude 1.5 explicitly identifies him as the one who delivered the people out of Egypt, the very thing attributed to the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, and it does so in this very context by referring to him as our only master and Lord, our only sovereign and Lord. Uh, so in verse 9, goes on to talk about Michael the archangel, uh, even if somebody did want to say this is a title for Jesus, it would show that Michael was not a created angel. Now, I don't hold that position, but there are uh, scholars who, who do hold that who aren't denying the full deity of Christ. They're simply saying that the word Michael, which means uh, like God, uh, is just another title for Jesus. I don't hold that, 
but in any case, if that were a title for Jesus, it would only prove that, uh, you know, in context, that Jesus is a divine person who rescued the people out of Egypt and not a created person. All right, this is a question for LJ, and LJ, I'm going to be honest, this is kind of, this is a question you might need to, you might want to think about because it's a kind of a deep question. You might, um, we could pause it, uh, but uh, LJ, what would you expect the angel of the Lord to say or do differently if he were indeed a second divine person? So, uh, in other words, everyone, because this, again, ladies and gentlemen, this is kind of a deep question. It's, it's basically, if the angel of the Lord were a second divine person and were trying to communicate that to human beings, what would he need to say or do differently if that's what he were trying to communicate? Okay, well, that, that's quite simple. What, what he would do um, is, is slightly different than what he wouldn't do. And what he wouldn't do is uh, separate himself from Yahweh by being called a Malach Yahweh, the, the angel of or the, the messenger of the Malach Yahweh. So I would say that in order to um, make himself a, a second person, he wouldn't distinguish himself away from Yahweh. Um, Mal like uh, Anthony will, will obviously agree that Malach is not a, an ontological term. It doesn't denote what that what that is. If he wants to denote um, that he is not just an, a messenger of the Lord, then he wouldn't use terminology that is used by other um, representatives of the Lord. It would it would it, it makes Malach Yahweh actually redundant, um, and I, I, it it would. It, it makes it pointless. Uh, I would quickly, uh, I just want to, um, uh, because um, Anthony got to answer a question about Jude 5 and it managed to bring up um, Christ there uh, or Jesus in, in Jude 1 5. Um, I, I just want to, to let people know that this is a highly contentious verse um, and it is not by any means. Um, sp override that 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 says christ uh, that says jesus there um there is <coughs> much evidence to say that the, the the original reading there was uh kurios um there are readings which say theon uh, and theos but um <laughs> i would highly can uh, argue against the the um the, the usage there i'd also go back to this the septuagint because um Anthony did uh, again brought up the, the Septuagint, uh, and I, I, I need to, to highlight the fact that um, Angelos Curio is the rendering of um, the angel of the Lord in the Septuagint in the Old Testament, and that same terminology uh, turns up uh, in the New Testament in multiple uh, cases. It is the um, the Angelos Curio is rep um, is calls himself Gabriel in um, in Luke 119. So if we're going to go back to the, the Septuagint, I, I just think that we, we should um, be aware that there are different readings here. Um, all right, this is a question that is, uh, it's been listed uh, multiple times um, by Midseer, and uh, he's put it down uh, as, a, as a question for both. Um, is Zechariah 2.10 a prophecy of the arrival of Jesus? Let me just read it for everyone. Um, Zechariah 2.10 says, Sing for joy and be glad, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I am coming and I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord. So the Lord there, Yahweh, says, I will dwell in your midst. Um, do you guys believe this is a prophecy of the arrival of Jesus? I'll let LJ go first this time. He got to answer two questions, so I'll, I'll switch the order here. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, yes. That's a prophecy Simple. about Jesus? That okay, so, so my answer is, listen to what Zechariah 2.10 says. Shout and be glad, daughter of Zion, for I am coming, and I will live among you, declares the Lord. Mm -hmm. Many nations will be joined to the Lord in that day. This is still Yahweh speaking and mm -hmm. will become my people. I will live among you, and you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. So here it says that it's Yahweh speaking, Yahweh's going to appear, Yahweh's going to dwell in, in our midst, and he says that Yahweh sent him. 
This, by the way, addresses LJ's observation that if the angel of the Lord was going to say that uh, he's just uh, he's not just a representative, he wouldn't uh, distinguish himself uh, from the Lord. But that assumes Unitarianism. The Old Testament text is not Unitarian, and Zechariah 2 is a perfect example of that. Here, uh, the Lord refers to the Lord, and he refers to him as the one who sent him. Uh, oh, yeah, you already answered. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, let's see. This is, I don't know what this, I don't know what this means for Anthony, but uh, for Anthony, can you please address Zechariah 3, 6? Not sure. Um, Zechariah 3, 6. Um, and the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua. Oh, okay. So I think he probably is including the rest of, in, in verse 7, it says, okay. this is what the Lord Almighty says. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I've already, I've already made the observation that the angel of the Lord, though Yahweh, even according to this context, he's called Yahweh in verse 2. It, he's standing, uh, Joshua's standing before the angel of the Lord, and then it says, the Lord said, the Lord rebuke you. So here the angel of the Lord contextually is called Yahweh and speaks about Yahweh. So I have no problem with verse 7 saying that the angel spoke about Yahweh as well. That's what's going on all throughout the context. That is clearly not Unitarian. It's uh, the Achilles heel of Unitarianism. It shows two divine persons, two persons who are called Yahweh, two persons who can refer to and interact with each other. So that's not any kind of problem for me. It's the very thing that I argue is fundamental to my position as a Trinitarian and absolutely contrary to LJ's position as a Unitarian. Daydream Believer, question to LJ. Um, what does he think of Joshua 5.15, where the angel says, take off your shoes for this is holy ground, an explicit claim of divinity that belongs to Yahweh alone? Um, where is it said that it's um, only to, to Yahweh alone? It's, the, the holy ground is because of the representation that, um, I mean, you... you there are certain things that you couldn't do in the temple, um, but it didn't mean that, that Yahweh was literally in the, in the temple. It's a, it's a holy place. Um, the, there's, uh, again, there's, there's uh, no need for, for that to, to be understood in, in that way um, at, at all. I, I don't even really... Because he's t taking off his, his shoes to, with the, the holy ground, because of the represent the this is yeah this is the representation of Yahweh here. The, but the, the, it it only appears in two verses. Um, there are many many times when the angel of the Lord or Yahweh comes to to people and they're not asked to take off their their shoes. This only appears in two verses. Let's see. Um, all right. And this is a question for both. Uh, question to both. Um, how do you explain Amos 4.11, where God says that he overthrew some of them, as God did with Sodom and Gomorrah, in complete harmony with the Genesis 19.14, where there are two Yahweh's acting? So, uh, Anthony, uh, your thoughts on that? Yeah, so in the first place, Genesis 1924 has a very unique construction, or at least definite uh, construction that's not really all that problematic. It's very easy to and straightforward in its import. It speaks of Yahweh, who was on earth, who appeared to Abraham, being in Sodom and about to overthrow it. And then it says in verse 24, not verse 14, it says, Then Yahweh reigned upon Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone and fire, from Yahweh out of heaven. Here, the text makes a distinction, a subject-object distinction, by the way. Uh, the first occurrence of Yahweh, it's referring to the subject. He's the one who's reigning from uh, another person called Yahweh out of heaven. It uses the direct object marker prior to the second occurrence of Yahweh, showing, again, a subject-object distinction. Sometimes Unitarians like to uh, appeal to other examples uh, that they think are uh, parallel to this, but I can assure you they're not. I'm probably not going to get a uh, chance to respond to LJ, and, and a passage he might think is parallel, but I can assure you in the Hebrew it's not the same. Uh, whether it's First Kings 8.1, whether it's Lamech and Genesis 4, no matter what text they want to bring up, it doesn't have this uh, construction in Hebrew. 
Uh, but you see that perpetuated in Amos 4.11 when God says, I overthrew you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. The same uh, distinction is perpetuated in uh, Jeremiah. It's perpetuated in Isaiah. Every time uh, Sodom and Gomorrah's destruction is referred to, it always attributes it to two persons identified as God or Yahweh. God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah by God or by Yahweh. The preposition in those cases, by the way, further demonstrates a personal distinction between these two. Um, all right, LJ, same question. Uh, how do you explain Amos 4.11, where God says that he overthrew some of them as God did with Sodom and Gomorrah in complete harmony with Genesis 19.14, where, uh, where there are two Yahwehs acting? Okay, so uh, Amos 11, um, 4.11, I actually um, put down to Iliasm, and uh, it's basically a Hebraism as Anthony pointed out, that this this um, usage is u used two other passages in in the Bible. It's just a um, a way of uh, referring to um, the way that that the, the Hebrews stated um, as God um, overthrew uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. When we go back to to the um, the, the story of uh, and and it will take probably a lot longer than than. I've got time for, but in in Genesis uh, nineteen thirteen, um, the angels that that came to uh, to Lot, they actually state that it that they will destroy the city. Uh, they have been sent by Yahweh to destroy the city. It is the two angels uh, representing Yahweh, and this proves that there are other angels that um, can represent Yahweh at any specific time. Three men come uh, in Genesis 18, 1. There are Targums that, that state this is uh, three angels, and it is two, the, the two angels that call down uh, fire and brimstone from Yahweh, who is still in heaven. They are the ones that are representing uh, Yahweh. They specifically say that we have come to destroy this this city because Yahweh has sent us to do it. Um, Lot understands this, and he says that Yahweh will destroy the city. Um, so, yeah, um, when when Yahweh calls down uh, fire from from Yahweh, this is not uh, the, this it's not a second Yahweh. This is the representation of Yahweh on earth, uh, calling to Yahweh in heaven. All right, uh, here's a question just for um, LJ. LJ, you said that Jesus never referred to himself to be the angel of the Lord. But how do you explain John eight fifty six to fifty eight? It seems to be such a reference. So, uh, I guess the claim there is that that's what that's what Jesus is referring to when he says, "Before Abraham was, I am." That uh, yeah. that, that Abraham saw the, the, him. That he's referring to the angel of the Lord. I, I guess that's the assumption. Not, yeah, Abraham didn't see uh, Jesus. Abraham saw his day. Abraham saw the day of Jesus by faith. Um, the I am statement here is just um, a ridiculous claim to, to back to, to Exodus uh, 3.14. I am is not the name of God. He specifically states the name of God um, in, in Exodus 3.15 as Yahweh. This is my name. Um, even the, the Septuagint, the, the Greek there is is different uh, between um, Exodus 3.14 and um, Abraham. Jesus, what what he says in John eight fifty eight, um, I am is just not the name of God. Um, he, Moses actually states that uh, he wants to know the name of uh, who who sent uh, who's sending him, and God actually states who he is before he states his name, or or rather what he is. He is what he is, and. Um, if we go in Exodus 3.12, I believe, the, the same word, Eir, is used there um, when he says, um, uh, sorry, I, I would have to go back uh, to Exodus 3.12. 
because uh, because he actually uses the the word there, and he said and he said certainly I will be with thee, and that is what he is saying. So when when he asks who sent you, he says I will be with you. Then in ex in the next verse, he actually states his name as Yahweh. So. Um, I don't believe there's a connection between uh, Exodus 3.14 and um, John 8.58 at all. All right. And here we have question for Anthony. Acts 7.53, Stephen says that angels gave the law, plural angels, angels gave the law. Yet in Exodus 24.12, God himself gave the law. Are these angels, plural, are these angels Yahweh? Uh, well, I certainly agree that angels were uh, present with God, but you don't have uh, angels being referred to in the plural as Yahweh. Uh, Yahweh is the one that they see. In fact, if you look at Exodus 24, it literally says they saw the God of Israel. In fact, it also goes on to say, and yet they did not die. So this kind of is very relevant to some of the attempts of LJ to respond to angel of the Lord text. He's saying it can't be God because God can't be seen. What he misses is that, is that in all of these cases, it points out the wonder of people, since they believed that they would die if they saw God, that they, they nevertheless see him but don't die. Uh, and, and Exodus 24 gives a, a perfect uh, uh, example of that when it says that God did not, uh, even though they saw God, it says he did not stretch out his hand against them. So this shows that God can appear to people in covenant with him, and, and they won't be struck dead, even if it is otherwise the case that people would ordinarily die if God appears. So this text uh, you know, doesn't pose any problem. Acts 7 uh, doesn't pose a problem. When God is present, of course there are other angels present. But what we don't see present in the text are these angels being referred to as Yahweh. We don't see angels in the plural being worshipped as Yahweh. We don't see them being rendered sacrifices like Yahweh. We don't see anything of the sort. And by the way, I would just quickly point out, since I didn't make the claim that John 8.58 connects to Exodus 3.14, uh, I do just want to point out for people that want to look at this, the connection is to Deuteronomy 32.39, where God says, See now that I am, and there is no God besides me. I put to death, I make alive, I have wounded, and I heal, and there is no one who can deliver out of my hand. There, the Hebrew phrase any who is translated in the Greek Septuagint as ego emi, which is an absolute uh, emphatic declaration uh, that's identical to Christ's I am statement in John 8:58. Moreover, Jesus even utters the very phrase of Yahweh in that same uh, time period in Genesis, or excuse me, John 7 through 10. Later in that same section of John's uh, gospel, Jesus says, no one can snatch them out of my hand, meaning the sheep that he gives eternal life to. So that's the connection. The connection is that Jesus is identifying himself as Yahweh in the Old Testament. All right. We will take a couple more, and then uh, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, this is from Sahih Luke. Question for LJ. You said God acted through his agents. That's why they can do these things. On that basis, would you say his agents can be called God and worshipped as the angel of the Lord did? His human. I, I presume this would be um, I, referring to. I the guess human, he's just referring to uh, other agent. other ag other agents, whether other angels, agents, or yeah. other angels uh, or humans. Yeah. Um, as I uh, explained, that there's there is um, a difference in the representation of the angel of the Lord. The the angel is a ministering spirit. That's what they are. They're they're ministering spirits. Human beings are not. Um, in the same way as what angels are they are representative and there are things that are attributed to the to the humans and they at times they can speak uh, as yahweh but um they they are not on the we're, we're not on the same level we have been it says in psalm 8 5 that we have been made uh, a little lower than the angels um so in the old testament uh, where, where um, God spoke through visions and dreams. Um, and a vision, I must say, is exactly that. It is a vision. It doesn't mean that there, there, um, it, it's a literal thing that is happening. Um, it's just a vision that, that, that's uh, happening, just as uh, a, a dream when Jacob saw the, um, the angels ascending on the ladder. Uh, this was a dream. It's not not an actuality that that what he saw. Um, so yeah, I would say that um, angels are just that they are higher. In the New Testament, God 
through uh, he spoke through prophets and through the angels in the old testament he now speaks through a son in the new testament uh right question for anthony uh question for uh let's see as angel has become associated with created heavenly beings would we not deduce that the later usages clarify the earlier so uh, i'm guessing he's referring to later uh, usages even in the bible like the new testament um if the uh if the understanding of angel comes to be associated with created heavenly beings um can you not conclude that that is a clarification of the earlier uses in the old testament yeah, I think maybe he's picking up or queuing off of something I said, that we have come to use the word angel specifically to denote heavenly creatures. I wasn't suggesting that the Bible does that. So it isn't the case that in the New Testament the term becomes associated exclusively with angels. Anyone reading the term angel or angelos in Greek always has to be aware of the context. So, for example, when Hebrews 1 says that angels are ministering spirits, uh, sent to uh, minister to those who are going to be the heirs of salvation, it's referring to created messengers. They're also told to worship Yahweh. So these are agents that worship Yahweh and who are ministering spirits to those who are heirs of salvation. But it's also true in the New Testament that the word angel continues to be used for others besides the heavenly hosts. I already pointed out that in uh, both uh, Matthew 11, Mark 1, the term angelos is used to refer to John the Baptist and Jesus. It says that uh, John was sent before Jesus. He's called a messenger. He's called an angelos. Jesus is called an angelos. The same thing is true elsewhere uh, in the New Testament. So it's just not true that uh, uh, it's it's clarifying it in the sense of, yes, this is, just means a created being. It doesn't mean that. It never means that. In fact, even in just the broader Greek-speaking world, the term angel didn't have any more specific meaning. You had gods that were referred to like Hermes, who was considered the messenger god. Hermes was a god in pagan in the pagan system. My point here is just to observe that in Greek, the term uh, angelos is used for him. So, e you know, even outside of the New Testament, uh, the Greek term just meant a messenger. And, and a person had to know only from the context what kind of messenger we're talking about. The term can be used for men, the heavenly hosts, and for God, and one can't keep appealing to it, ignoring that or pretending that, that you know, that can just go away, and, and, and we can get away with saying that the angel's not God because he's called a Malach. Uh, he's called God, you know, so in any case. Um, all right, this is a question for both. First Colossians 1.17 asks, uh, for both, how do you interpret Genesis 22, 11, and 12? So I'll just go ahead and read the passage here. Genesis 22, 11, and 12. So famous passage, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. So there are actually a couple of, uh, there are actually a couple things in that, in that, uh, in those two verses where uh, he might wanting, want to be calling attention, so I'm not sure. But what are you guys' in understanding of that? Since this is the angel of the Lord speaking uh, to Abraham, uh, how do you understand this passage? Okay, yeah, I, I gave, I think, uh, some detail in my opening presentation uh, that God commands a Abraham, tests Abraham, and says, offer up your son. The angel of the Lord comes along and then tells Abraham, don't do it. Now I know that you fear God, referring to God as a distinct person, but then saying you haven't withheld your son from me, identifying himself as a divine person, the one that Abraham was offering this supreme act of obedience and worship to. Uh, and, and this is confirmed, moreover, in Genesis 26, when Yahweh appears to Isaac and says, I'm the one who swore the oath to Abraham your father. That oath is the one that's made here later in the context of Genesis 22, when the angel promises Abraham that because he didn't withhold his son from him, he's going to bless him and do all these uh, things that he promises there. Uh, in fact, I'd even point out that later he says he's going to do this because you obeyed my voice. So the angel says, you didn't withhold your son from me, you didn't disobey my voice, therefore I'm going to bless you, I'm going to multiply you, and he makes an oath. And later, this same thing is explicitly said to have been done by Yahweh. Okay, uh, I'm not. I'm not going to change the the answer that I've already given. Um, that 
that this is just a the the representation of Yahweh here. Um, uh, it's the angel of the Lord that calls out of heaven, um, who is representing uh, Yahweh. I, I I don't really need to elaborate on on the fact that Abraham saw in Genesis fifteen one. He saw a vision uh, in Genesis 12:7. Um, God appeared to Abraham. The the appeared word there, uh, Ra'a, the same form is the same uh, form that where uh, back in G- Genesis 35:1, where um, God says that He appeared to uh, Jacob. And if we go back to where he appeared to Jacob, he appeared to Jacob in uh, in Genesis 28, which was through uh, which was through a dream. So this this connects literally the the dream that uh, Abraham uh, that Jacob had in Genesis 28 to what Abraham uh, was when God appeared to Abraham in Genesis 12:7. And we have a vision in Genesis 15, 1, and then we have the angel of the Lord uh, calling from um, heaven in Genesis 22. Abraham actually never did see um, the uh, the angel of the Lord physically. It, it was all through um, a vision and dreams. And again, this is just a Yahweh calling from, from heaven. Uh, and the angel of the Lord who is representing him, speaking in the first person as the as Yahweh. All right. Well, we are coming upon three hours here, so I'm going to have one uh, one more question for each participant, and then I'll give you sort of each a minute to just you know tell people where they can uh, find you and and so on. Um, this is from let's see, this is from Gadimba Gabinga. Adutola. He says, uh, and Anthony's already touched on this kind of, but. Um, uh dr rogers if and if the angel of the lord is yahweh and his face was seen doesn't that contradict scripture that says no one can see god and live and is the angel a person of the trinity so you've already maybe you came in late but go ahead and uh, go ahead and respond to that uh, so is that a contradiction if the angel of the lord is yahweh and his face was seen doesn't that contradict the scripture that says no one can see God and live? And is the angel of the Lord a person of the Trinity? Yeah, so you're right. I did touch on this a number of times, and I actually, there's a number of ironies here. So in the first place, though, just to recap, I pointed out that the texts that talk about no man being able to see the, uh, the Lord and live are all angel of the Lord texts. Every time they encounter him, they really think he's God and fear that they're going to die. And the reason they do so is because they know that God coming spells judgment for wicked sinners who are in opposition to him. But God, although a consuming fire, can appear and dwell with his people and not consume them, the very thing symbolized in the burning bush in Exodus 3. That's why we read in Exodus 24, it says that they saw the God of Israel, that is Moses, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and the 70 elders, and it says, but he did not stretch out his hand against them. So they, they saw God and should have died, but God in an act of mercy saved them. But I want you to notice something. LJ just got through admitting and saying that when uh, Abraham, for example, saw the angel, he didn't really see him literally. It was just a vision or a dream. Well, that means then that LJ loses entirely this argument, even if he doesn't agree with the answer I've given. Because now he's saying that the angel of the Lord was never literally seen, in which case one can't say he's not God, even when the text says he was seen, because these were just visions. These were just, and by the way, I don't agree that that's how the word vision is being used in those passages. The word vision can often refer to something that's extra uh, mental. It doesn't have to refer to a psychological experience uh, in the Bible. Uh, right now, final... Oh, and I should say real quickly, this is not an answer to anything. I just want to make sure if somebody keeps calling me Dr. Rogers, um, you know, maybe someday uh, the Lord will be gracious and I can pursue further studies. Uh, I have been through school, uh, seminary and so forth, but I am not yet officially a doctor of anything. Uh, yes, if anyone would like to uh, fund Anthony's fur- future education, you're welcome to uh, do that. And then he could be Dr. Rogers. All right, final question for uh, LJ here. To LJ, how is... Um, I, th- I think this is a reference to earlier when you were asked, what would the angel of the Lord do differently if he were a person of uh, a, a second, you know, a second uh, uh, person of the Godhead? Um, but... Uh, Andrew here says, how is the angel 
not doing exactly what you wanted in Judges 2 when he says it was he who formed the covenant with Israel and it was he who brought them out of Egypt. What else need be said? Um, right, okay. Um, I just want to quickly address something Anthony said there about what I said. Um, I didn't say that the angel of the Lord was never seen. I, I said that Abraham didn't see um, the angel of the Lord. I just want to clarify that just in case anybody um, confuses that. The angel of the Lord was clearly seen, um, but Abraham didn't see him. Um, the Bible says that, um, that Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt. Um, so it was God, it was the angel, it was Moses. Um, all three are, are called uh, or the, the person that brought Israel out of Egypt. So um, I don't think that by saying that I brought you out of Egypt actually um, disconnects him uh, or, or from from Yahweh and, and keeps that uh him being Yahweh, because then we could uh, we could simply apply that to say, well, Moses was the was also the one that um, brought out e Israel from Egypt. The, the fact is, is that through the through the the line um, of of agency there, um, I, I don't want to use the, really. I, I'm using the word a, the agency, but it's it's really just a messenger. And, and I know that the, the language of agency was introduced. Um, at a much later date, but it, it's it's not really agency. It's just messenger. It's it's just a messenger of God. Um, so when we have Malach Yahweh, it is a messenger of God. Uh, so I, I don't think that 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 actually works by saying that um, that the angel brought uh, Egypt, Israel from Egypt. I don't I don't think that that you can do that. All right. Thank you again to uh, both of our debaters for a respectful three hours. Uh, I'm going to give you each, uh, you know, 30 seconds to a, to a minute. Keep it short, not for any f further debate. The debate is over. Uh, but just any uh, any final thoughts on uh, how people can uh, follow you or if you want to send them to any uh, website or YouTube uh, page at all. Uh, any thoughts on that, Anthony? Uh, yeah, first, I just thank LJ quickly for a great debate. I enjoyed it very much. Uh, and I'm looking forward to going to the bathroom in a minute. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, it's been a great time. I thank you for a great debate. Uh, I thank everybody for watching. I hope it was beneficial and edifying for you. I pray the name of the Lord was uh, was lifted up and praised. Uh, people want to see anything further from me, they can come to this channel. I have videos on here. David is sitting on a bunch of them for some reason, uh, but uh, yeah, so you can come here. I have articles on answering Islam.org uh, that are on this topic, by the way, as well as many other topics. So you can find some of my resources here and there, so. All right, LJ. Uh, okay, so yeah, I, I'd like to thank Anthony um, for for the debate as well. Um, <laughs> I really enjoyed it. Uh, I'm, I'm not very good when it comes to the live situation um, and thinking on my feet, I, I don't, um, the, the passages and verses don't come to my mind as quickly as um, as they they do to for Anthony. He's been at it a, a, a lot longer than me, um, and uh, probably haven't represented myself in the in the way that I would like to. But you can you can come to my website, um, which is www.followingtruth.com. Uh, I'll answer any messages. I'm much better as a keyboard warrior, uh, and I can explain um, myself. I think in a much better way. Um, so I, I'm, I'm happy to, if anybody wants to add me on Facebook and they can attack me with, with all of the, the uh, questions and, and everything and, and t show me where, where I've aired in the, in the debate. Um, oh. I'm more than happy to, to address uh, anybody that would like to, to actually engage me more when I have a, maybe a little bit more time to, to think about answers or um, to, to uh, bring in a, a different verses and, and things where, I, where maybe I haven't quite done um, as, as I would have liked to have done in, in a live debate. I'm, like I say, I'm, I'm learning. Um, this is only my second live debate. Um, 
And I, I'm not very good in the life situation, but um, I, again, thank you very much for um, spending three hours with me. Uh, and uh, I look forward to, to a bit more engagement with you uh, online um, where we where we might be able to. Uh, I'm going to uh, address a lot of what you've brought up in this um, in this debate uh, and, and address it a little bit, maybe a little bit better um, on, on, in a written form. All right. Thanks, LJ. Thanks, Anthony. And uh, for all of you who are watching now, I should be live again tomorrow with Hatun Tash, where we'll be discussing uh, different editions, different, uh, different versions of the Quran. So hope to see you all then. And until the next debate, catch you all later.